Hello, everyone. Let's get started. I'd like to call the September 14th, 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting of the Ottawa Carleton District School Board to order and acknowledge that the meeting is taking place on unceded Algonquin territories. I would like to thank the Algonquin nations for hosting this meeting on their land. And thank you very much. And at this point in our agenda, I'd like to call for a mover to approve the agenda. Trustee Lyra, go ahead. Thank you very much. Are there any changes to the agenda? Um, I would like to move 8.3 to the end of the matters for action. So it would come in at 8.8. .8. Okay. So let's just take a look at that here specifically so that trustees uh, know what they're voting for. So 8.3 is the motion for eligible students be required. Uh, the, it's this uh, notice of motion request for vaccine requirements for eligible students. Is that correct? I think it should be the end of the matters for action section because I suspect it's going to eat a great deal of our time and I'd like us to pass many of these motions. So I think it should be addressed last. All right, um, so that is a proposal to move 8.3 to the end of the matters for action section. Is there any, um, is there any discussion on that? Trustee Blackburn? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not in favor of that at all. Many, many people I am sure are watching this meeting and want uh, a decision made. Uh, tonight, and uh, if we don't deal with it right away, we risk not dealing with it at all. And uh, I think that would be uh, unacceptable to uh, a lot of people. We need to make this decision tonight. Thank you very much. And any further discussion? Seeing none. So, uh, Trustee Lyra, do you have a wrap up on that? Okay, uh, let's call a question on only on Trustee Lyra's uh, proposed uh, schedule agenda amendment. So all those in favor of amending the agenda as per Trustee Lyra's request. And opposed. So uh, that is defeated. Are there any further uh, proposed changes to the agenda? And seeing none, I'd like to call the question on the agenda. All those in favor as of the agenda? And opposed? Thank you very much. And so we have an approved agenda. Thank you very much. And moving on to uh, delegations. And before we get to the de delegations, I just wanna make a brief statement. Um, so before we hear from tonight's delegations, I'd like to share that due to the significant number of requests to delegate, the chair made the choice to limit the number and time for each delegation this evening, since we have quite a bit of stuff to do this evening. This decision was made in order to balance the need for your voices on these important issues to be heard while ensuring trustees have the time to make necessary decisions. I would also like to add that the timing of each delegation is specifically two or three minutes and that I will monitor the timing very closely. I hope the delegations, trustees and community members will embrace the spirit of community of character attributes, which we aim to instill in our students and be courteous, respectful and polite in their discourse. Therefore, at the end of your speaking time, I will ask you to include your presentation immediately. Should your delegation become disrespectful or hostile, you will be muted. I will warn you that further behavior will result in your being removed from the meeting. Once trustees and members have had the opportunity to ask questions of clarification, you're required to leave this meeting um, and staff will remove you if you do not exit. You are most welcome, however, to continue to observe the meeting through the live stream link. So with those um, floor rules, let's carry on to um, our first delegation. And that is Sarah Lynn Levine and Cantor Jason. And you have three minutes. Are you uh, present? Yes. 
Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Go ahead. Carry, carry oh. on, uh, Sarah Lynn or Cantor, go ahead. I think Sarah Lynn's having trouble getting in. Oh, okay. Uh, can, you, can somebody let her in, please? She's joining now. There she is. All right, Sarah Lynn, it's all you. Can you hear me? I'm here. You're good. Yes, good evening. I'm right here. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. I grew up, I grew up as a Jewish kid in a small town in New Brunswick, and I was one of the only three Jewish kids in my high school of 1100. I had swastikas carved in my locker. And can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I had paper airplanes thrown at me with swastikas on them. I had hoped that my children would uh, not face the same type of uh, anti-Semitism that I faced as a child. And unfortunately that was not the case. My youngest son has faced anti-Semitic incidents in the OCDSB classroom from students and from well-intentioned but untrained or misinformed teachers. Today, I'm asking for your help and support. The Ottawa Jewish community is a religious and ethnic minority representing a diverse group of people from various backgrounds, colors, and levels of observance. As you may be aware, the Jewish community in general and our children in particular have recently been faced with an unprecedented and terrifying rise in anti-Semitic hate, particularly in our local schools. Make no mistake, Jewish students in OCDSB schools are experiencing harm on a daily basis. Let me say that again. Jewish students are experiencing harm in our schools, in your schools, every day. B'nai B'rith Canada, a well-recognized Canadian Jewish community organization, has reported that in May 2021 alone, reports of anti-Semitic incidents were at least equal to the entire year of 2020, which was already exceptionally high. Most bigotry is an assertion of inferiority and speaks the language of oppression. The OCDSB prides itself on its policies of inclusion, equity, safety, and human rights for all. And yet, I'm aware that anti-Semitic acts and language continue to threaten your Jewish staff and our children, and this must stop immediately. Students need to know that they can come to school and feel safe and not worry about who will know they are Jewish. Jewish staff should feel comfortable to openly display their religion or speak about it. If this is not able to occur, are we really as inclusive as we think we are? Are we really concerned about the safety of all of our students if these simple acts of human dignity are not respected? We ask that you include anti-Semitism in the equity work and training that you are doing with your faculty and staff. We ask that you make this training mandatory, not optional. As you continue to develop the human rights document and the equity and indigenous roadmap, we ask that you include how to combat anti-Semitism in your work and ensure that this is part of your teacher training. We are committed to working with you and committed to being an ally in all the good work that you are doing to protect the rights of protected groups. We hope that you commit to supporting and protecting us and our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there any questions of clarification amongst the trustees? And seeing no quest questions of clarification amongst the trustees, I'd like to thank you very much for your delegation. And um, we're going to move on to uh, Shira Waldman. And I can see that you're there, uh, Ms. Waldman. So. Uh, you have three minutes, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Chair. I do see uh, Susan Gardner had her hand up and I know that we usually just ask that uh, we allow questions from trustees, but I would raise my hand and say, I would ask a question, but give it to Susan. Um, I don't know if that's possible. 
I really I don't want to make an exception not. because of the time. Yeah, but, fair uh, enough. I'll, I'll allow this one. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Gardner. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Trustee Schwartz. Um, I just wanted to, to thank the delegation and say that we have heard from our Jewish members and conversations both with the district and within the union are ongoing. ETFO is an equity-seeking union whose goal is to work with others to create schools, communities, and a society that is free from discrimination. At this year's annual meeting, ETFO delegates supported the formation of a new task force to examine issues of anti-Semitism. I encourage the board to also take action to address is there a question, Ms. anti-Semitism and all other forms of discrimination that impact our school communities. I would, yes, I have a question for the delegate. <laughs> um, okay. I would like to ask actually um, where um, this information is coming from. We don't actually have any data ourselves. And I'm just wondering, um, besides anecdotal um, stories that may be amongst the community, if there is anywhere um, where, um, where this information is being shared. Thank you. So we're starting to gather much. that information. We've put together some um, systems in place for reporting and tracking, and um, we're hoping to uh, include that information uh, to present to anyone who's interested to see that uh, information from whether it's a middle school, a high school, an elementary school, whether it's a teacher or student related, um, if it's information that's happening in the classroom. And um, we feel that that uh, data, while right now it is uh, anecdotal uh, and largely anecdotal, but in large numbers, uh, we will be uh, pre preparing and tracking that information. So we will be able to provide that moving forward. Very much. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from trustees for this delegation? Thanks, seeing uh, none. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jason Cantor and Sarah Lynn Levine for your delegation. And we're gonna move on to, uh, um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, Shira or Shira Waldman. Go ahead, you have three minutes, thank you. And you're muted for some reason, it looks like so. Okay. Go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You're a dirty Jew. I dropped a penny. Aren't you going to pick it up? Heil Hitler, can't you take a joke? I was dude at the store yesterday. Jews are dumb. Can you tell which of these insults were aimed at me in the 1980s versus those directed at my, at my daughter 40 years later? Heartbreakingly, my children are not only dealing with similar taunts in the classroom, but face even more painful hate speech and harassment online by their fellow students at OCDSB schools. I'm here today because I don't know where else to turn. Please help. Imagine going to school every day, afraid to reveal your identity and living with the fear that if they knew you'd face classmates who drew swastikas on your desk and dropped money on the floor in front of you. What if your family was murdered in concentration camps in Poland, but your cohort threw around the term Holocaust 2.0 and told you to leave the room if it bothered you? My daughter's final year of high school was traumatic. She ended every day frustrated and outraged by the blatant hatred and ignorance being spread both in class and online. When she reached out to her teacher, he didn't know how to handle it, nor was the administration able to put a stop to the increasingly disturbing threats circulating online. These very same threats that caused a younger Jewish student to transfer to another school. My husband and I have reached out to the principal and superintendent numerous times. We know that the same student who was harassing our daughter continues to spread anti-Semitic hate. How are parents supposed to trust OCDSB schools to keep our children safe? You cannot be an inclusive school board while only including certain marginalized groups. If you're not consequencing the bullies, you must take a serious look at your employees. The ignorance is criminal and the mental health of these children and their families is at risk. Currently when Jewish students feel unsafe, their only option is to transfer to SRB. It cannot be that in our city, there is only one high school that is safe and only because there is a larger percentage of Jewish students attending there. Please educate your staff and students. Change your technology contract immediately to have serious consequences. Teach students to discuss global politics without spreading hatred and misinformation. Reach out to Jewish teachers and community leaders to help you get it right and demonstrate ways we can work together towards peace. 
allow the professionals, the police to do their jobs. I know they've reached out to you numerous times to help train your staff and students. Why aren't you taking advantage of this? I still have two students at, or sorry, two children at John McRae and one set to attend in 2023. I hope that they will be able to wear a Star of David with pride, discuss their Jewish and Israeli identity and face their classmates without fear. Actions always speak louder than words. Please follow your own policies and procedures. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there any questions for this delegation? And seeing none, I'd like to thank you very much for your delegation. Um, and let's move on to um, Talia Friedhoff. I don't see you on my screen, but if um, you're there. Oh, there you are. You have three minutes. Uh, go ahead, please. Hey, right, thank you. As a Jewish student in the OCDSB, you generally feel responsible for advocating for yourself. Yes, there are rules preventing the assignment of important lessons, projects, or tests on the most important Jewish holidays, and everyone knows that outright saying Jews are bad is a problem, but it's seldom that these rules are actually practiced or that insidious anti-Semitic comments are actually addressed. As a Jew in high school, you worry about missing a day and falling behind because you have to go to shul for Rosh Hashanah or fast for Yom Kippur. As a Jew, you know that no one's going to defend you in a case of anti-Semitism because no one knows enough to do so. And as a Jew, you know that the reality is that even if you speak up, there's a real possibility that nothing will change. You're in charge of telling your class about the Jews murdered in the Holocaust. You're in charge of explaining to your teachers why it's so wrong for them to fight you and why the, des the test date should be changed when scheduled on a Jewish holy day. And you are in charge of deleting your social medias until the latest wave of anti-Semitic posts on your friends' stories blows over. My name is Tally Friedhoff, and I'm a senior at SRP High School, a high school with one of the highest Jewish populations in Ottawa. And yet, at the beginning of the year, I was still nervous to wear my Magen David necklace to class. The fact of the matter is that while anti-Semitism has always been a prominent issue in school environments, it's only been getting worse in recent years. Over my time in high school, I've seen anti-Semitism from students and teachers alike. I've heard jokes in the hallway about bombing Jerusalem, the Holocaust, Nazis, and greedy Jews, heard stories of Jewish students who've had money thrown at them by their classmates. And in the last few years of high school, I've had multiple teachers schedule important assignments and tests on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Although I didn't always have the opportunity, resources, or safety assurance to speak up to fellow students, in all of the instances involving teachers who had either inadvertently or blatantly disregarded the rules around Jewish holidays, I decided to speak up. And every time I was shut down as teachers refused to move these dates, in one instance even after the vice principal specifically instructed it. In fact, the only time in my entire high school experience that a teacher successfully dealt with anti-Semitism or even dealt with it at all was in my grade 11 anthropology class when Pierce tasked with the Jewish Culture Project presented incredibly anti-Semitic information about Jews in Israel. While well, initially left unaddressed as soon as I wrote an email detailing the problematic content in the presentation, the teacher admitted their fault and addressed it genuinely and accurately the following day with the class. At the time, this blew me away because up until that point, I had literally never seen any non-Jewish person advocate for Jewish people in a school environment. During May, at the height of the media coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I, like many other Jewish students, found myself amidst a surge of anti-Semitism online. I saw dozens and dozens of reposted anti-Semitic posts from nearly everyone I followed, many which were simply uneducated friends. I felt terrified to speak up, nervous I would get death threats or shoved into endless tiring debates if I did. With only a handful of Jewish allies and far too many uneducated peers are posting anti-Semitic, hateful, and threatening posts, I, like so many Jewish teens that I know, shut down my social media accounts as a means to protecting my mental health. Jewish students should have the right to feel safe expressing their Judaism. They should not have to feel alone in the discrimination they face or fear that teachers may contribute to anti-Semitism if they do speak up. As a Jewish Excuse student- me, Ms. Ms. Friedhoff, could you uh, please uh, wrap it up? Yeah, I'm on my last um, part, sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> As a Jewish student in the OCDSB, you generally feel responsible for advocating for yourself, but we shouldn't have to. Thank you very much. And we do have a question from Trustee Scott. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, Tal Talia, for doing a very good job of advocating for yourself tonight. If there was just one thing that you thought that teachers could do better to address incidents of anti-Semitic behavior in, in the classroom, what do you think that would be? What, what to you is the most important 
first thing we have to be doing? Uh, I think that we really need to be educating the teachers thoroughly on what is and isn't anti-Semitic, you know, according to the IRA um, guidelines uh, to what anti-Semitism is. Um, and I would love if they um, kind of, if the responsibility was passed to them as opposed to the Jewish students um, to actually like know what to say um, when something is anti-Semitic versus like instead of um, Jewish students having to go up to them separately and telling them uh, that something is anti-Semitic and trying to address it themselves if teachers just knew and were able to do that uh, without any aid from Jewish students. Thank you very much. Thank you. And are there further questions for uh, Ms. Friedhoff? And seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your delegations. It's good to see students acting for themselves. And moving on to our next delegation. Uh, this is a three minute delegation and it's from uh, Lisa Lauer. Uh, go ahead. Well, I see she's just connecting here. So Lisa Lauer, you are um, next. Please uh, go ahead with your delegation. And right now you're muted. Okay, now you're unmuted, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, one second, please. I'm just trying to find my link here. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hi, I'm a parent with uh, two kids, one in elementary, one in high school. Um, so Thames Valley School Board, Peel and York School Boards are now allowing extracurriculars in, in their programming. Peel and York have higher infection rates than Toronto which has paused theirs. I'm wondering what the rationale is for Ottawa's uber cautious approach when we currently have six COVID cases in hospital and one in ICU. And I believe cases are declining. If not now, when? The board's principle is to do no harm and trustee Evans aims to prevent one, even one death or case of long COVID with special concern for the most vulnerable. While laudable, I'm wondering how this no harm works when the prevention methods themselves, cessation of extracurriculars, vaccination and lockdown are inflicting immense harm on a population at little to no risk of harm from COVID-19 and who have been carrying the brunt until now. We tend not to adequately assess and measure harms from these perhaps well-intentioned preventative measures with our exclusive focus on COVID-19. Yes, we have to protect vulnerable children as best we can, Yet threats to health have always existed, and this has never meant diminishing seriously the lives and the potential of all healthy children. It might be easy to discount the importance of a high school soccer team, a drama club, debate club, or choir in comparison to long COVID, let alone a death. And yet debates about actual risks aside, this oversimplifies the question. These are formative years. Our overreactive actions constantly based on fear as fed by the media with the belief that infection with COVID equals certain death and thus a zero tolerance approach to cases are snuffing out the very life and spirit of our youth and depriving them of a time when they can develop their potential, try new interests, develop lifelong friendships, find their strengths, their self value, their life's work, their direction, their passions and develop into leaders. This time isn't regainable, adulthood and life and work life soon begins. We don't account for this. Instead, we likely shut our youth away for a third year of seclusion, deprivation, hours of video games alone in their room, instead of a vibrant life of organized sports or the like, based on caution. This isn't without costs. The consequent issues of obesity, depression, substance abuse, loss of purpose, loss of self-value, loss of direction and bad habits follow. Where does this go? Does it suddenly lift after years of diminished social and mental development and physical activity? Can the mark this leaves on a person be easily removed? Um, with 80% of the population, including older population now vaccinated and a return to normal once promised, I'm not sure I understand. Are we protecting the vaccinated, the unvaccinated? or keeping cases down, ever tested cases, whatever case means, and school to keep schools open, which I thought vaccinations were for. Instead, we are teaching them fear, fear of each other, fear of disease, apathy, and disempowerment. Isn't this dangerous? Extracurriculars will also no doubt be impacted by a vaccine mandate if passed. 
As young people have their entire lives ahead of them, side effects and injuries require greater scrutiny. I'm not going to go into myocarditis and other uh, risks because these will be covered by others. Letters of liability are now being served across Europe, the, the US and Canada to members of parliament who are calling for mandates to school boards and to employers to hold them liable for any side effects or worse, debilitating injury. Ms. Lawyer, can I ask you to uh, um, wrap up your delegation, sure. please? Yeah. I want to ask the board um, whether it will require constant updating of vaccination status with boosters of these new mRNA shots to stay eligible for school and for sports since immunity wanes at six months. Can the board provide science on the need for and safety of repeated shots for children? I recommend voting against the vaccine requirement for eligible students and urge the board to start all extracurriculars immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, with regards to your uh, question about extracurriculars, I'm going to uh, deviate slightly and ask uh, uh, Director Williams-Taylor if she has a brief comment on that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I will make a brief comment uh, simply to say that um, we certainly continue to uh, agree that uh, extracurricular activities are uh, very, very important and very much a part of school life. Uh, and we are um, starting to uh, see uh, extracurriculars take um, uh, start to take shape uh, in the district. Uh, and uh, we do have uh, ongoing conversations with the other, other districts in Ottawa because we do some uh, shared uh, extracurricular uh, activities uh, through sports across the, um, the region. Uh, but as in every year, um, extracurriculars don't roll out on the first, you know, first day of school. Uh, we are actually on the fourth day of school uh, today. Uh, and so it is a progressive rollout and it will be a progress progressive rollout uh, this year, uh, albeit there are considerations for what's best inside, what's best outside, what's best with small groups, what's best with large groups. So there are certainly um, other um, considerations that have been uh, uh, laid on, um, but certainly uh, it is not uh, accurate to say that uh, there are no, no extracurricular activities uh, happening in the OCDSB um, because they are indeed um, coming on board slowly and um, progressively over the course of this month. Thank you very much, Director. And um, is there any questions for this um, delegation? And seeing no questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your delegation. And we're gonna move on to um, Stephen McRoberts. And you, go Mr. ahead, go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, my wife and I would like to thank all the trustees and board members that are here tonight. We appreciate your care and concern for all employees and students. The topic of mandatory vaccinations is difficult. My name is Stephen McRoberts, this is my wife Michelle, and we have two children ages 11 and 13 in OCDSB schools. Michelle and I have both had our COVID-19 vaccinations. Our children have had all of the mandatory vaccinations. We are advocates of vaccinations that have been well-researched and well-tested. We have not vaccinated our eligible child for COVID-19 yet because the Pfizer mRNA vaccine is new and the long-term risks are unknown. It is feasible that new detrimental side effects are still to be discovered, considering that the vaccine has only been used for a few months in kids. Our children are at the tender ages of 11 and 13 with their lives ahead of them from puberty to reproduction and beyond. We would like the choice to vaccinate later with more scientific data, considering the excellent protective measures already in place within the schools. We feel that we are informed parents and would like to make a decision without pressure. We feel that our children are safe in school with the measures in place. So we want them to continue to be welcomed at school, vaccinated or not. Our children love being in school but we would make the difficult decision to pull them out of the classroom or even the school board if vaccines become mandatory. We love our schools and don't want to leave them. And so we ask you to vote against motion 7.3 to make vaccines mandatory for eligible children. We believe that parents have the responsibility to make this choice for their children during these early stages of vaccine rollout. 
And we believe that the province has a responsibility to decide which vaccines are mandatory, as they historically have done, only once the short and long-term risks are measured and well understood. We also ask you to vote against Motion 7.5. Please allow the Ministry of Education the time to research the facts and understand the science as it applies to children. Please do not put additional pressure on them to act in haste. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. And uh, we do have a question from Trustee Ellis. Go ahead. Um, thank you. So if I have this right, your concern is that we don't know what the long-term impact of vaccines might be. How many years do you think you would need before you would feel confident that you know what those long-term effects are? Mm -hmm. um, I think once the emergency measures in, by the FDA and the temporary measures from Health Canada are lifted, that is... Um, that is likely our timing. And we understand that we, we won't know the reproductive effects if there was anything long-term, but it would just be nice to have, you know, another year or so longer to, to see what, what comes up in the meantime. And what about long-term effects of catching COVID? How concerned are you on that? Mm -hmm. um, we know it's a concern. Um, I have a, a friend who has long-term COVID. Um, what we are understanding is that in children, the risk is lower. And we also feel that they are well protected in the schools with mm -hmm. the masks and, and everything. I mean, the schools have been fantastic and there's just so much else that we need to consider like their emotional health. They love mm -hmm. the schools, the teachers have, just the most amazing impact on our kids. We've had such great experiences that there's just so much else to look at. And with all the protective measures in place, I mean, they're there for a reason. I think they're, they are doing a great job. All right, any further questions for this delegation? And seeing none, thank you very much for your delegation. Really appreciate it. And moving on to um, Maria Perillo, go ahead. Thank you, everyone. You have three minutes. <clears throat> Great. My name is Maria and the Carillo family. I come with the backing of my well-seated ancestors and the hundreds of parents within this community who support a culture of inclusivity that respects the health and wellness of our children, that bases its decisions on solid scientific evidence and upholds and respects our inherent rights and freedoms. As a parent, I'm very uneasy with the hasty push towards vaccinating our youth in a climate where science is unfolding daily around what we know about SARS-CoV-2 and the possible impact both positive and negative around the COVID-19 experimental vaccines. My overall ask tonight simple is for the board to slow down and not implement policies that will cause division and segregation within our community, once again, shifting the burden of this pandemic onto our children, making them take responsibility for something that is not theirs to bear and potentially putting them at risk as will also be identified by others speaking this evening. Regarding the notice of motion by Trustee Lyra Evans for mandated vaccine requirements for SARS-CoV-2 for students, I ask that the board vote no. I ask that the board undertake a scientifically based risk benefit analysis of such edicts, an analysis that places our children's health and well-being as the top priority. Furthermore, please be reminded that the burden of proof resides with the school board. In accordance with section 11.3b, of the board's rules and bylaws, I ask that the answers to the following questions be publicly disclosed in writing by September 27th, 2021. From where does the board derive the authority to mandate a medical procedure that's still in clinical trial phase and is only being administered as a result of emergency measures? From where does the board derive the authority to override the Canadian Bill of Rights, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Ontario Human Rights Code, which outlines that all children have the right to an education without discrimination? to publicly disclose the supporting scientific evidence, not political policies, behind any decision the board makes regarding health protocols, masking, testing, hand sanitizing, and mandated SARS-CoV-2 experimental vaccines for the public school system. 
to demonstrate that the supporting documentation I provide for the delegation has been received and reviewed by all members prior to voting. And to provide proof of receipt and consideration of the open letter sent to the board on September 13th by Associate Professor of Viral Immuno Immunology, Dr. Biram Bridal, requesting a delay in the formal vote requiring mandatory vaccine vaccination until he has had a chance to confer with the board. The school board is reminded that any decisions it takes with respect to mandating experimental medical procedures is in direct violation of the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Code 1947. I ask that the board demonstrate that it understands the legal implications if it chooses to mandate experimental vaccines related to SARS-CoV-2, that all members of the board, its employees, principals, teachers, and staff may be held legally and financially liable. Finally, I ask that we take a moment to breathe together, to be reminded of our shared humanity, that we are all under tremendous strain due to the unfolding of events of the past 18 months that we are all seeking the highest and best outcome for our children, our families, and our communities, that we all care deeply about our children's futures, futures, and to remember that united we stand, but divided we fall. We must come Thank together with love, care, and respect for all. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much for your delegation. I'm just wondering if there's any questions from any trustees. Trustee Alice? Um, Chair, and I, I don't know who to direct this to, but the last delegation referred to the vaccinations as experimental, and, and that's not, I think that's a mischaracterization of it. Um, I just wanted to put that on the record. Yes, they're still under clinical trials until 2223, all of them. So they are experimental at this point, and we do not have long-term data as has been presented by other delegations this evening. Thank you. We do have a question from student trustee Salam Alada. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? We can. All right. Uh, good evening and thank you for your delegation. Uh, I would just like to ask you um, how comfortable would you be uh, to send your children to school um, and doing extracurricular activities and such without vaccinations? Absolutely 100% comfortable. Right. As of right now, the vaccinations do not provide um, the they don't block transmission or the possibility to get the um, COVID right now. And as was mentioned in the uh, prior delegation, we don't have the long term evidence there. According to the VAERS reporting system, um, we have 50 and I forget the actual stat, but we have a lot of kids that are um, suffering from myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart. And those who are aged 12 to 17 are at highest risk for that. And these are long-term um, disabilities that can come as a result of the vaccine. So we just don't have enough information right now. Um, I have vaccinated my children in the past. I always weigh the risk and the benefits with my doctor. And um, as others have mentioned this evening, like right now, we just don't have the data we need to slow down and we have to look at the science. We, this has been extremely politicized and we are rushing down a really slippery slope and we're harming our kids. So right now I'm absolutely confident in sending my children without vaccines if, if that were the case, but I also am not disclosing our medical information that's covered under the Privacy Act of Canada. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you very Chair. much. And Chair. Trustee Ellis, did you have a question? I, well, I just wanna, they refer to the VAERS database in a way that that VAERS database is not meant to be used. The VAERS database do not have confirmed um, incidents to the vaccine. It's just a simply a reporting and collection tool where it's then confirmed through other means. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Ellis. And seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank you for your delegation, uh, Ms. Carino. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to uh, Mr. James Graham. Go ahead, Mr. Graham. And you have two minutes. Um, Hi, thank you, sorry for the time. Dear trustees and board members, thank you for your time. Informed consent is a rule of law for any medical practice. Are we informed? To be informed, we must be made aware of the risks and benefits of any medical treatment. Given that science, and most importantly, the medical community must necessarily operate under the guiding principles of 
objective, unbiased inquiry, open conversation and debate of the conflicting views, I argue that we are not being given the opportunity to have informed consent. On April 30th, 2021, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario issued a statement forbidding physicians from questioning or debating any and or all of the official measures imposed in response to COVID-19. Dr. Bridal, who has written to this trustee board, a highly respected and accredited viral immunology professor, has been targeted by so-called fact checkers and deplatformed due to his professional views on the risks of using the currently available vaccines for COVID-19. Many more extremely qualified and respected professionals in their fields are quickly denounced and deplatformed to avoid so-called dangerous opinions. I ask you to consider if this state of affairs with media, public health spokespeople, discrediting differing opinions is for the betterment of the public or focused on other agendas, like the pharmaceutical wealth created through mass vaccination and mandating these drugs for continuous use. Public Health Canada has not provided treatment protocols for COVID-19, even though there are numerous peer-reviewed studies that prove cheap and effective treatments are available. The Nuremberg Code, UN Declaration of Human Rights, and UNESCO Universal Declaration of Bioethics gives Canadian citizens the right to consent to any medical intervention after being fully informed about intention, risks and benefits, and to be free from any coercion in any form I ask you to vote against any motion to promote and to require new vaccination requirements until you can demand concrete evidence of the benefits and risks in doing so. I beg you to do this, to prevent any undue harm to the students and or staff. Thank, Thank you very for much. Time. And uh, could you shut down your screen, uh, Mr. Graham, please, your share screen? Yes. Thank you very much. And are there any questions for Mr. Graham? And seeing no questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your delegation. Thank you. And we're moving on to Drew Klein. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, dear parents, can you believe that in the year 2021 in Canada, how much time and energy we must allocate to protect, defend, and fight for the basic human rights of our children? to defend them from the perpetually wrong, fear-mongering, pearl-clutching, anti-science, data-ignoring, hysterical, couch-fainting authoritarians in Ottawa's education and public health departments. And we are failing to protect them. So look no further than last month's mandate by these trustees to mask five-year-olds. But I digress, and I rise in strong opposition to mandatory vaccinations for a disease that has killed exactly zero Ottawa school-age children, and for an injectable therapeutic that has exactly zero long-term studies to show their safety and efficacy. Our children have the right to a normal education, the right to bodily autonomy and informed consent, and the right to not be coerced into any medical intervention for fear of reprisal. And we, as their parents, have the right to decide what is best for them, not you. There is clear evidence that the injectable mRNA therapeutics do not meet these benchmarks or risk-benefit profiles required to be considered safe, effective, or necessary for anyone under the age of 50, least of all our children. The problem, you see, is not so much the spike protein stab, but with the people who are trying to mandate it. To them, the vaccine is a talisman. It's an idol. It's a golden calf to be worshipped, to be believed in without question. COVID is their religion and the vaccine is their Lord and Savior. They want to receive it without knowing if it will work. They want to give it to their children without understanding the long-term effects. They want to force you and your children to take it without knowledge of your medical condition. They ignore the mounting evidence that it's failing. They consider no alternatives that will offer better protection. And most concerning, if you oppose the golden calf or doubt its safety and efficacy, then you are to be destroyed. This is mass madness. This attempt by the ruling class bureaucrats to divide us, to segregate the stabbed from the unstabbed, as though the former are both moral and virtuous and the latter are evil and uncaring, is an extremely dangerous precedent. Mandating Mr. Klein, I'd ask you to wrap up your, your uh, delegation. Please, mandating what minutes. we as parents put into our children's bodies is a direct encroachment of our Canadian civil liberties. Their coercion constitutes medical tyranny, and there will be Mr. devastating... Mr. Klein, if you don't end, I'm going to meet you, please. Who step alongside those who promote mandatory... I'm going to meet you now. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Chair. 
And seeing how he's muted, I, I'm not going to ask for questions. <laughs> But instead, I'm going to thank all delegations for their presentations this evening. Um, and uh, I would like to note that we had an additional eight written delegations submitted and are attached to the agenda for trustees to review. And I'd like to thank the members of the community for their thoughtful submissions. And then moving on in the agenda, I'd like to uh, call upon the chair for her briefing. So go ahead, uh, Chair Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to begin with the topic of anti-Semitism in OCDSB schools. It was deeply troubling tonight to hear some of the delegations expressing their fears about safety in our schools and their experience of hatred because of their faith. Last week, the OCDSB shared with all students, families, and staff a statement on anti-Semitism, which you can find on our website. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to emphasize that all students, families, and staff should feel safe and protected for expressing who they are at the OCDSB. We strongly condemn all forms of anti-Semitism, racism, discrimination, and we recognize our obligation to educate, prevent, challenge, and address anti-Semitism. We all have a role to play in identifying and calling out anti-Semitism when we see it. Anyone who sees or experiences anti-Semitism should reach out to any trusted staff member who can support and intervene. Such incidents can also be reported to the principal or vice principal or to the Office of the Human Rights and Equity Advisor. I also wish to recognize that this is a very special time, time of year for the Jewish community. Rosh Hashanah was last week and Yom Kippur begins Wednesday evening. Best wishes to all the families who are marking these important days. Secondly, I would like to offer huge thanks to all of our staff who've done such a great job getting our schools up and running again. It's not just the teachers, principals, vice principals, educational assistants, ECEs, school office staff and custodians who greeted children in their schools last week, but all the facilities staff who worked through the summer to improve the physical condition of our schools, all the human resources and planning staff who supported the recruitment and allocation of staff to schools, all of the B and LT people who've made sure our digital since they're working, all of the summer school staff who supported student learning through July and August, and clerical staff, and so many other special people who've been working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that schools would be ready for students. The work isn't finished yet. There will be adjustments as we continue to sort out class size issues and work with OSTA on solutions to canceled bus routes. And finally, I would like to say thank you to all of the families who entrust their children to us every school day. Some of you I know are currently very challenged getting your children to and from school right now. We know that's not a sustainable solution, situation and we're working as hard as we can to find some solutions. Many of you go above and beyond on a regular basis to support your children's learning. And we know you are all sending us the very best students that we could possibly wish for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Scott. And I'm wondering if we have any um, questions for the chair. And seeing none, I'd like to move on to briefing from the director. Go ahead. Madam Director. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Penny. Uh, and I'd like to uh, just start my comments by echoing the comments uh, of uh, the board chair uh, in uh, thanks to those who have been very active in their engagement in getting our schools uh, ready to receive students. Indeed, uh, the senior team has spent uh, the last uh, 10 days or so uh, in a variety of visits. Uh, so we have been present in our schools and have been able to see uh, firsthand uh, the readiness uh, and in uh, some cases uh, on 
the first day of school, uh, it uh, certainly did us all good to see um, our children in seats and in lineups and on the playground, um, because certainly when it is we welcome our children back um, and our young people and our youth back, uh, it brings um, that life and vibrancy back into our schools. So again, uh, echoing that thanks uh, to uh, the teams that uh, helped to achieve this. Uh, on September the 30th, we will mark the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day. Students will be attending school on this day. Uh, we will be reflecting on Canada's shameful legacy of residential schools in an age appropriate manner across the district. While the trauma and tragedy is, real, is very real, it is also that it, important that we emphasize the strength, the beauty, the brilliance and genius of Indigenous knowledge and culture. I would note that these are lessons that will not be isolated to one day, uh, but we will continue throughout the school year to, to uh, engage in our conversations and learnings about Indigenous ways of being. The OCDSB virtual night school program for fall 2021 is now open for registration. Uh, this program is open to students in all school boards and adult learners and, and adult learners. In, in for information including how to register and course offerings can be found on our website. The registration closes on September 20th and that's coming up soon. The Ottawa Student Transportation Authority continues to face serious bus driver shortages and has been forced to cancel some routes and Chair Scott has made reference to this. I would like to remind families to register for the OSTA parent portal to be updated for any changes and cancellations because as Chair Scott noted, uh, OSTA continues to work very hard to rectify the challenges and information is ongoing and continues to be updated regularly. With a return to school, we also ask that all drivers are extra vigilant for children on our roads. Please slow down and obey all school bus signs. I encourage families to talk about traffic safety with your children as well, as we have many students who are walkers and bike riders to school. If possible, please consider parking a few box blocks away from your school to help avoid congestion. Uh, and OSTA offers walking route maps, which provide suggestions to help students to walk safely to school. And those are my comments uh, for this afternoon's or this evening's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And are there any questions for uh, the director? Ms. Lamba? I, yes, I just have a few. I'm interested to know for Orange, um, for September 30th, what, um, what was done to ensure that when that's being discussed with all schools and students, that it's, you know, that the message is going to be done in a proper way and not, you know, sometimes when we try to do that, we cause more harm if people aren't properly trained um, in doing things like that. So what are the, the measures that are put into place to ensure whatever you're doing on September 30th will, you know, benefit the uh, students in moving this issue forward. Thank you, Ms. Lambert, through you, Chair. Uh, this was a discussion that we actually undertook this morning um, in our uh, Executive Council meeting. It was long and robust, and we did have that very advice uh, on the table for discussion. I will turn it to Superintendent Smith, uh, who is uh, engaged with the teams that are working collaboratively uh, to ensure um, a safe rollout uh, and engagement of all students uh, with cognizance that the day is different uh, and the reality is felt differently for Indigenous students than students who are um, not Indigenous. Uh, Superintendent Smith, please. Thank you, uh, Director, and through you, Chair. Um, the Indigenous uh, Learning Team is working with colleagues from various departments across the district to prepare for September 30th, which we're seeing not as a one-off event, but rather as um, the beginning of a year of learning around truth and reconciliation, as well as the um, harmful impacts and ongoing legacy of residential schools. That concern that you raised, Ms. Lambda, Lamba, is um, one that has been raised by our Indigenous learning team and that we are paying um, a great deal of attention to. In our communications, we will be very clear that September 30th is um, a day of reflection and a day of learning. And that um, for those of us who are um, not Indigenous, it is our responsibility to engage in that in a meaningful way. 
There will be a series of um, preparation opportunities where we will invite staff and school leaders who are planning the events taking place in the day to come together. We will also have very clear communication and guidance provided um, through memos to the system, um, advising staff around um, the selection of resources. We are also curating resources, again, as a collaborative team working with our Indigenous learning team and um, cross departmental partners um, to prepare for that day. The other piece that I do want to mention is that September 30th is a day that Indigenous students and staff may access leave related to days of significance and holy days. And so we want to ensure that all staff and students are aware of that and that um, they have the ability to join in with some of our synchronous opportunities throughout the day, if they wish, from their homes with their family, um, as well as if they choose to be at school, that those opportunities will be there for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank um, you very much. And I, and I yeah, guess, the, yeah, I was just going to say, I guess the Indigenous community is providing input in that. That's, that's, that's good. I have another question, and it's a follow up from the last meeting. And that's around some of the preparations for the school and thing. I'm just curious what the update is on sort of, um, we heard about um, uh, extracurriculars, but specifically about the music program. <laughs> I'm following up on that. So what is, what are the progress since the last time on, on the music program and how kids can benefit from that, from, you know, in-person learning, whether it's in band or music class, has anything happened since then? Because I know that's also really good for the mental health of the kids. Just curious. Uh, just in the interest of time, I will turn it directly to uh, A.D. Reynolds uh, for comment on that. Uh, Superintendent uh, Tawage is not with us this evening. Thanks, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, normally uh, our Superintendent of Program and Learning would be able to answer this. Um, uh, long and short, uh, you know, band repertoire classes, music, instrumental music classes, uh, the music curriculum is still being taught and is still uh, advancing. Um, there are uh, in recommendations, uh, part of the recommendations are a lot of restriction around the use, especially the indoor use of woodwind or brass instruments. So that's really what the uh, the sticking point uh, is. Uh, I know I've seen some of our bands uh, outside uh, when they or music classes outside when they can be um, and engaging uh, that way. But uh, they're still continuing to teach. Um, but there there are some restrictions in terms of how much playing can happen, particularly in indoor spaces. Um, you know, we continue to work with OPH on that, and once those recommendations uh, are, are able to change, uh, we will very uh, eagerly uh, implement those uh, those back in the classes and in the uh, in the bands. Okay, because I know for people like for kids, high school students who are taking music, one of the requirements is band. So will kids be able to, um, if they don't want to, if they can't do it in person, because I know last year was a disaster uh, for band in many places and kids sort of just um, didn't want to do it virtually. Are you going to be accommodating children who will not be wanting to do band virtually? So uh, in the OCDSB, uh, I think without exception, all of our bands are in fact classes uh, that students sign up for in, in the in secondary school. They sign up for through option sheets and uh, those courses are running. In some cases, they do have virtual components uh, if they are what we call an outside the timetable course. And, you know, I don't want to necessarily get all the details around how those are set up, uh, but they're still able to complete the course, complete the curriculum and get their credit. Uh, but there will be certain elements of in-person play uh, as, as discussed that are, you know, restricted uh, for now and and hopefully we'll be able to change as the year uh, evolves. That's great. I'm just saying when it's the band part outside of the thing, that's that I understand is virtual, you will probably have to think about accommodating the students because that's required as part of their music part. That's all. Thank you. That, that was it. Thank you very much. And Director, you also had a uh, COVID update, did you? Yes, uh, thank you. And through you, Chair, I'll proceed to the uh, COVID update. 
Um, so we have uh, the uh, slide, slide presentation here. We have uh, tried to keep it uh, to be uh, quite tight, to be pertinent to the things that trustees have raised. Um, I do feel it's important in light of the, var the varying um, nature of comments that we received um, and that the public would be observing um, in terms of the delegations, um, that it's important for me to reference that um, as it's very clear to trustees and very clear to our public that there are many, many pers positions, perspectives, and opinions uh, on the right way to go uh, in this particular scenario. Uh, we've certainly all heard the words uncharted and unprecedented uh, over and over again. Uh, I prefer to use uh, the term no blueprint, um, and certainly we continue to um, uh, learn as we go. Uh, but one of the things that we as a district, um, as a province, uh, as educators in public uh, education, uh, and on this board of trustees has been very diligent in this way, is that we've made a choice as to where it is we're going to draw the information that will inform our decisions. So in our case, uh, we are drawing our direction, our information uh, from the direction and the guidance of the Ministry of Education. Um, similarly, we are drawing uh, guidance and direction from um, not only Ministries of Health, but most specifically, um, Ottawa Public Health. Uh, Ottawa Public Health has been an incredible partner. Um, everyone at this table has admitted none of us are doctors, um, none of us are medical practitioners, and we have had to make a decision about who it is that is going to help to guide us in the decision making that we undertake. So while it is that there are multiple opportunities for people to engage in many, many uh, different discourses around what appears to be true, um, what they believe to be true, uh, we are informed in our practice uh, by the guidance of our public health uh, and our public health partners. So that's an important piece for me to proceed um, my comments with, uh, because uh, certainly for the public, um, much of this can be very confusing, um, and we want to make it very clear where um, our position is. Um, so at this point, I'd like you to advance some um to the first slide, please. Um, so cer certainly uh, you've already heard uh, that um, we are uh, excited about the fact that we have received our students back in school. The majority of our students have returned in person. Um, and as you can see uh, in the picture there, uh, that uh, we have all manner of staff uh, who have done um, above and beyond in all kinds of ways uh, to ensure that the way has been paved uh, for a safe return. Um, we do recognize and it's important to uh, um, re remind our public that we're talking here about layers and layers of uh, protection, um, that it isn't just one single approach to uh, creating a safe environment, um, that in fact we have looked we're looking at each context differently. Also, we need to recognize that our schools are very different, the layouts are different, the class sizes are different, the classes are different. And so we've tried to um, balance our um, system direction um, with localized decision-making at school levels to ensure as normalized as possible an environment for our children to return. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I have uh, intimated uh, that many of the safety uh, measures continue to be in place, uh, and I know that many people are very anxious to see us do away with those uh, those measures and return to full normal. Um, we certainly uh, embrace the opportunity when it is 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 with us, uh, but we continue to receive the guidance from uh, from uh, public health partners that we need to maintain um, our masking, our hand washing, our distancing where where it is possible, uh, check temperatures to do our screening before coming in, and most importantly, uh, if any of us are unwell um, and our children are unwell, to keep them home um, and to ensure uh, that we are, in fact, um, uh, quite quite uh, convinced and uh, confident that there are no symptoms before uh, having students return to school. And we know that when we are all um, collaborating on these efforts, uh, that what we do see is a positive result in that we are keeping COVID at bay and, and out of our schools. I'll turn the slides over to um, A.D. Reynolds at this point, who will continue uh, through with the remainder of the update. A.D. Reynolds. Thanks, uh, please advance the uh, deck. So public health ha has been working with the school boards, the four boards, uh, and they've continued to update their protocols and procedures. They're all available on their website for uh, any parents or member of the public who want to go and take a look at them to see what does happen. Uh, for example, when a student becomes ill at school or a positive case is identified in terms of the steps and the measures that are in place. And again, these are uh, continue to be updated as needed as, uh, as practices evolve. Next slide. 
Uh, and like all school boards in Ontario, uh, our schools are reporting uh, on a daily basis any positive, confirmed positive COVID-19 cases in staff or students, as well as any closures uh, that are mandated by Ottawa Public Health or outbreaks that are identified. Uh, so that is available as well on our website. Um, at this time, we had, uh, at noon today, we had five active cases. We do have a few more. Uh, I think we're approaching uh, possibly eight, um, but we have no closures or no outbreaks uh, to this moment. Next slide, please. So uh, the vaccine attestation, a very complex uh, process that's underway, and I'll ask uh, Superintendent McCoy to uh, provide uh, the next the update on the next couple of slides. Uh, thank you. And yes, just uh, briefly, as, um, as the board is aware, um, we did um, uh, launch our attestation form on um, September the uh, 3rd, uh, so the Friday before um, students were, um, were due back and the first day that our staff was at school. Um, to date, so as of today, and I think this is on the, um, uh, the next slide, <clears throat> um, we have over 10,000 staff responses, which represents uh, almost 85% of, um, of completion. Um, so we've had a, a really a positive um, a response from, uh, from staff, and we are in the process of following up with, um, with staff who, for different reasons, have not yet completed the attestation. Um, of respondents who, um, of those who responded, uh, over 95% uh, reporting that they are fully vaccinated. Um, we have um, a small number who reported that they are partially vaccinated and uh, will be updating their attestation um, once they um, achieve full vaccination. And then um, we have um, a small number who are seeking an exemption either based on medical or religious reasons who are reporting that they are unvaccinated or who have indicated that they um, do not wish to disclose, in which case we will be um, uh, treating them the same way we are others who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, so next steps, um, we have received the, um, uh, the kits from the uh, ministry and we're in the process of identifying um, who will need to complete testing and um, coordinating the distribution of the tests and then establishing the process for monitoring results. Um, today we received the education program developed by the ministry and so we will be um, again rolling that out to uh, any employees who have um, indicated that they are not fully uh, vaccinated. Um, and who are not, um, who have not requested a medical exemption. Uh, we're following up with those who have not completed the attestation yet. Uh, and we are um, in the process of um, finalizing and will be um, uh, launching a, an attestation for non-employees. So for those who um, uh, are in our schools on a frequent basis and who have uh, direct contact with either students or staff, we will also be asking them to um, indicate um, uh, or to disclose their vaccination um, status in compliance with the uh, ministry um, disclosure policy. Great, thanks very much, uh, Superintendent McCoy. So there's been a lot of conversation around uh, testing it is most recently in conjunction with the uh, vaccine attestation. So I just wanted to provide a little clarity around what all the different avenues are uh, through which our students and staff may experience testing. Uh, as we saw over the last year, the assessment centers continue to operate uh, in the city, you know, through the, uh, through the Ottawa hospitals, they use a the PCR testing and not, uh, not rapid antigens, uh, particularly that's where you can receive those tests for uh, symptomatic individuals. Um, and that is an ongoing uh, source of uh, access to testing for staff, students, uh, and their families. We have uh, begun the introduction of some take-home test kits in schools. Uh, this is overseen by the hospitals, um, not, not just CHEO, but CHEO is certainly a lead partner in that. Again, it's a PCR test, uh, and those are being distributed uh, to schools on an ongoing basis. Uh, eventually, they'll be in all schools, but uh, beginning with uh, schools in some of our neighborhoods of priorities identified by OPH. Uh, and therefore, symptomatic and asymptomatic symptomatic high-risk contacts that are identified at school or people who develop symptoms at school so they can take that test kit home with them uh, so that they uh, just to help facilitate the testing during their period of isolation. Testing non-vaccinated staff, as uh, Superintendent McCoy talked about, we it is part of the ministry mandate. It is a rapid antigen test. Uh, they are becoming available will be uh, two times a week. Uh, and just in terms of the nuts and bolts and how those uh, results are shared back with the employer is still being uh, worked out, but we hope to have that fairly shortly. 
You may have also heard of a high school test, uh, more of a surveillance type testing. There's a pilot underway that's being led by the ministry. Uh, it is at this time not in any OCDSB schools. We are not a participating board, so we do not have surveillance testing of our secondary students in, in Ottawa. But, you know, if that changes, we'll, uh, we'll let you know. Next slide. So uh, just for so people aware, since it's part of a conversation we're having uh, later, you know, uh, earlier in the month, we received a revised ministry guidance. So in addition to uh, their uh, stated requirement that medical masks, surgical procedural be required by all staff uh, inside buildings, uh, that has now been extended uh, to staff working out of doors where physical distancing cannot be, uh, you know, maintained. So for the most part, it's a requirement of all of our staff supervising students uh, while they're working outdoors. Uh, so we're very much following the, the ministry requirement to uh, have staff wearing surgical or procedural uh, medical masks. Next slide, please. There have been questions around class size requirements. Um, you know, I, I, I'll turn it back over to Superintendent McCoy if she wishes to comment, but largely we're staffing uh, back within our collective agreements and ministry regulations. So class sizes now uh, resemble uh, what they did uh, in, in not the previous school year, but the one before, but Superintendent McCoy. But thanks. And uh, yeah, just to um, uh, comment briefly. So we have included on the slide the um, uh, the regulatory um, uh, maximum class sizes or average class sizes. So for kindergarten, classes are capped at 29 students. Uh, there's a, one teacher and one ECE in each class. For our primary grades, um, no class can be above 23 and 90% of our classes need to be 20 or below. For grades four to eight, um, there is no um, uh, class by class uh, max size, but um, there is a system average that we adhere to, which is 24.5 um, um, students across all of our junior and intermediate classes um, would um, indicate that as we did last year, um, we did make some effort to um, uh, make the classes that are in our OCB sites um, larger than our in-person classes, again, um, considering the, uh, the health and safety aspects and that it would allow us um, some additional flexibility in our uh, in-person classes, but certainly we're in the process now of confirming our actual enrollment and we'll be making um, adjustments as we always do in the fall uh, based on the class sizes that we are seeing in our, in our schools, both in-person and uh, virtual. Thank you, next slide. Just a summary of what was discussed, so advance to the next slide, please. Uh, if there are any questions persisting around ventilation, uh, our website contains a, a great deal of information in the ventilation and schools section. Uh, just to reiterate what we discussed at a previous meeting, you know, uh, investments in ventilation uh, have been ongoing and continue throughout the school year, not only to uh, the mechanical systems that are in place, but as well uh, portable HEPA filters, of which there are quite a number, uh, as well as other uh, improvements that are, are able to be made, uh, a role of CO2 monitoring, for example, a rollout of CO2 monitoring, so people can access that webpage and even get some information on some of the uh, school by school uh, specific improvements that have occurred as well if they are cur curious. Next slide. And uh, we have time for some questions if there are any. And thank you very much. And we're going to start with uh, Trustee Schwartz. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll try to be really quick. Um, I was just, I've heard from a couple of Z teachers in particular around um, sort of interscholastic uh, sports versus sort of what's allowed in class. And so, um, and, and an example of this is um, that interscholastic, they're not students aren't necessarily required to be masked, but in class they are. And so I'm just wondering if I can get uh, some clarification on that point in particular. And then the second, the second piece as to why certain sports are being allowed in an in interscholastic sport like basketball, which is not being allowed in the classroom. There just doesn't seem to be sort of consistency uh, based on some of the conversations I've had. So just curious about sort of some of the safety protocols and, and then also why we're allowing some things, but not others. Thank you, uh, three, Mr. Chair. So 
there have always been sports that have been played interscholastically or played differently than it, than are played in phys ed class. For example, we do not have tackle football in phys ed class. We don't have contact hockey. We do not have, you know, and, and so there, there are always those, those differences, uh, as well as the degree or the intensity of play that happens interscholastically compared to in a, a phys ed class. So they never look the same. Um, uh, some sports are, are more similar than others, I'll grant. Uh, so masking in any interscholastic sport that's happening indoors uh, is, is required, uh, and it's something that's strongly encouraged and in many cases may be quite required in outdoor sports as well. And it's being looked at on a sport by sport situation. We're talking with Ottawa Public Health, and again, this is largely overseen between the four boards, so it's not something that uh, you know, we necessarily have uh, pure autonomy in, in the decision making of. Um, basketball is uh, permitted in, in gym class, you know, using masks like, like they do. So, you know, we're only four days in and I'm sure that the opening of our, our schools has required, you know, a lot of other questions being answered first and some of that information will get, you know, uh, passed along. Um, but there, there won't be much um, conceivably much difference between what, what, it, what we're seeing other than as always the intensity and the type of play that happens interscholastically may, will re may require certain differences in, in the measures that are put in place. Okay. Thank you. That helps. And I appreciate uh, my random question being answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to trustee Scott. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I did have one more question. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Just I, for, I no forgot. Problem. I did want to ask about how the lunch hour is going in particular, because this did come up at, at our last meeting where I did ask about um, how we were going to manage um, mask wearing and then not masks at lunch hour. And how how are we finding overall sort of that period of time in, in the school, since there's a lot more kids in, in schools this year? So I'm, I'm assuming secondary, not the nutrition. Um, but it's just yeah, yeah. Well, secondary. either, actually either. If we could just have a comment on that, both elementary and secondary. Sure. So in elementary, the nutrition breaks continue in classes as they did through last year with masks just being removed when there's actual active eating occurring. Uh, and, and that seems to be continuing well. It, it, it proved to be uh, pretty safe last year and, uh, and you know, no reason to believe it won't be this year. Secondary, we do have lunch hours in our schools for the first time in, in over a year. Uh, you know, and schools have taken a variety of measures around uh, cohorting students by grade, uh, cohorting, placing cohorts of students within certain geographic locations. Uh, many students are taking advantage of the good weather to eat outside. Um, certainly it is, uh, it's, a, it's a big change in adjustment so far. Uh, you know, what I'm hearing from our principals, I, and I usually hear if they're uh, really struggling with it, is that, you know, it's, it's going okay and people are learning the habits. But again, you kind of want to keep uh, community expectations and people expectations, uh, you know, realistic. You know, th there's a lot of students to supervise at a time. And so there will be, you know, uh, breaks and slips up in protocol. And we'll try to correct that student behavior and, and educate them as to why we want them to follow it. And again, we're building on the experience of the other three districts that did have more experience with this last year. And so, you know, we're, we're having the similar protocols in place that they, they found, uh, along with OPH, found worked fairly well in their sites last year. Okay, thank you. That is it for my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And moving to Chair Scott, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first question relates to class sizes and relative to the COVID protocols we have in place. Certainly a lot of us are hearing uh, concerns about what seem to be very large class sizes, especially in the elementary grades. And I know that the count date is coming up and uh, measures will be taken to rebalance the class sizes where, where that is needed. But basically, are we confident that with a class of say 30 kids, we actually have enough um, protocols in place that even though distancing may not be possible to the extent some would like, uh, our kids are still not, not being placed at undue risk? 
So I'll begin. I don't know if Superintendent McCoy wants to comment. I know her camera is not on, so I don't think so. Uh, so last year, just a you know reminder for for parents and whatnot. On on the whole, on the aggregate, yes, our classes were a little bit smaller, but that certainly did not mean that we did not have classes uh, and many classes throughout the system that are the same size that they are now. You know, we had kindergarten classes of twenty nine or intermediate classes uh, approaching thirty uh, last year uh, throughout. You know, uh, you know, pre vaccination throughout the pandemic as we do as we do now and. Uh, and, you know, we certainly got to test out a lot of those uh, protocols and procedures. So, yes, we are confident uh, that that they are safe. Uh, you know, measures like all the vaccination in the community and 12 and 12 and up really do help, even though it's indirect with uh, with that safety. So um, at this point, we have no reason to believe that continuing with the measures we keep we've kept in place won't uh, won't limit, if not uh, significantly avoid any uh, risks of transmission within those classes. Thank you very much for that. The, the second one is really a, a, a several part question relating to transportation. Uh, I know I'm hearing a lot from some very, very desperate families whose kids' buses have been canceled. And what I would appreciate having some understanding of is uh, whether some of the difficulty in addressing these, I know people say, could we put some of these kids on the neighboring bus, which doesn't seem to be full. Is that all being impacted by, by COVID considerations, as well as the usual logistics issues around how buses are allocated and routes are designed? The second question relates to those students who are uh, on OC Transpo. Uh, where, again, parents are expressing concerns about safety uh, and COVID transmission, uh, where, where uh, other passengers may not be observing the, the public health protocols. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, I'll begin the question. And I do know that um, CFO Kirsten has uh, also been active uh, in com conversation with ASTA. Uh, so we do recognize, uh, Trustee Scott, that, um, you know, we do, we are uh, faced with um, some significant uh, dr driver shortages. Um, we, we can, uh, we can speculate uh, about the impact of COVID uh, on um, those shortages. Uh, there are multiple reasons for the shortage. Um, I'm quite confident that, you know, families Families um, are not interested in those reasons. They're just interested in the fact that um, buses are no longer available or are not available at this time. One of the things that we can say is that um, uh, ASTA is, uh, as they do every year, uh, works um, over, like, during the course of every day, uh, corrections are made continuously. Uh, and so we do see that um, there are corrections um, and recalibrations of those routes um, daily and sometimes multiple times daily. So as I'm in my uh, said in my comments earlier, it's important that families are on the portal so that they are notified for where changes uh, do take place. It's difficult for us to comment on um, the behaviors of uh, others on uh, OC Transpo. Um, we do recognize that um, uh, when it is that we have community spread under control, it certainly um, has a positive impact in our schools. Um, but certainly, the expectation that our students um, maintain uh, the the uh, protocol that they're being taught. Uh, A.D. Reynolds certainly made reference to the fact that where it is that we have slip-ups, we continue to educate our students because it's important for us to remember as well that many of these students, while they are taking OC Transpo to come to school, that many of those students are also using OC Transpo for some of their extracurricular, for their community um, activities, as well as for uh, work uh, because we have a large cohort of our students who do in fact go to work um, and they use public transportation. So the the, the, the protective factor is the education around how it is that students are able to uh, conduct themselves and protect themselves um, in, in um, these public circumstances. Uh, I don't know, CFO Carson, if you have any further comment uh, on the question for uh, Chair Scott. I think the only comment I'll make, Chair, is that there, uh, OSTA always goes through the process of consolidating routes where possible once they get a better handle on how many students are actually taking advantage of buses. Uh, it is a little bit complicated this year in that uh, in order to reduce the possibility of mixing of cohorts and to make sure that we don't create problems for contact tracing that they are waiting until we're sure that that consolidation will be able to continue. So it is a, it's rather complex. It does take some time. 
And uh, part of the issue really does um, revolve around concerns for overall safety. When, we're, when they are able to look at those possible consolidations, remembering today is our fourth day of school, they wanna be able to communicate those changes to drivers and parents and schools to maximize the uh, uh, safety of students and to make sure that we don't end up with kids that are being dropped off where we're not expecting them, or in some cases worse, that they're left standing at the bus at the stop in the morning. So those are all factors. None of them um, help parents that are trying to wrestle with this at this time, but it is one of our realities. And I do know that uh, OSTA is looking uh, at the loads um, daily to try to get a sense of where we can consolidate some trips and beyond, and that will allow them and us to uh, serve more of the students who are in fact eligible for transportation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Trustee Fisher. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess the question I have um, first, I want to, you know, Brett, I want to thank the team for going as fast as you can in terms of thinking about extracurricular sports. You know, obviously, I think Mark, you're reopening our, our schools in the evening to, to community use. Um, I've had a number of discussions with different groups in the city of Ottawa, boys and girls clubs, others who really rely on our space, uh, need physical activity, need that, that space, um, you know, to, you know, get off the streets, to get out of the neighborhood, to find, uh, to find mentorship and support, um, that they're not getting access to those spaces. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how are staff thinking about, you know, that opportunity and, and reopening our schools to some of those, those organizations and programs. Um, from what I've been told, they're certainly willing to do uh, whatever they need to do to, to operate those programs in a safe way, uh, whether it's paying for extra cleaning, you know, making sure that, um, you, know, um, you know, adults and, and students and in, in, in youth participating in the pro pro programs are fully vaccinated. Um, and so I guess, you know, I just want to know, like, how are we thinking about that, that community use of space and um, opening that back up to our communities? Sufo Carson, could you Maybe jump it's in Mike, here? yeah. Yeah. We, we've been looking at this uh, since the month of July. We made the decision that we would not be issuing permits for the month of September while we tried to make sure that we were in a position to handle the opening of school and to see what the impact um, of the reopening of school would have on uh, COVID in general. We have had discussions with groups and with Ottawa Public Health about how we might be able to begin to reintroduce some of those community uses in the fall um, and what some of the conditions would be. I know we saw a draft protocol from Ottawa Public Health uh, on the weekend, and I think we'll be discussing it further tomorrow. That will form the basis of our uh, guidelines to community groups. Um, we are also trying to make sure that we do, in fact, have our, enough of our own staff to manage the evenings properly uh, because of the way we've had to uh, 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 shift hours to continue the cleaning during the daytime. And the final piece of it is that we will need to, um, we won't be able to open fully. We won't be able to put as many groups into a building and as many and turn of space over as often in an evening as we used to just because of uh, these COVID protocols. So where um, it might not have been unheard of for um, uh, gyms at Confed to be turned over two, maybe even three, four times a night, I think we're gonna have to restrict that. And as we issue permits, we are focusing on youth and young people. We have some adult users and uh, to be frank, those have not been at the top of the list as we try to look at how we're going to manage uh, through the, the coming months. The other decision factor for us is making sure that the group is in a position to provide the appropriate supervision. We are uh, trying to work our way through um, the uh, disclosure protocol on vaccinations that the, that the 
government and the ministry have imposed upon school boards to see how we're going to manage that. And uh, to be quite frank, we're also waiting to uh, see some of the outcome of some of the debate this evening and at board around uh, any further restrictions on those who can access the property. So we, we have recognized from the beginning that uh, uh, access to our schools is important, uh, but we wanted to uh, take, a, take a pause in the month of September while we got a sense of uh, uh, what the year might look like. And we have had good cooperation. As I said, we were quite pleased. Ottawa Public Health asked us to comment on the draft that our custodial staff and community use staff were able to provide some uh, helpful suggestions. And we should have some more news on that. I, I can't say later this week, but I, I do think early next week, we will be in a position to start talking about um, what and when the re some of those reopenings will look like. Sorry to ramble. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Mike. That's a really useful update. Um, obviously, I really pre appreciate the prudence. I think we've done that every step of the way and really appreciate the prioritization on, on youth. I think if we are to prioritize, I think that's that's the right way to do it and, and uh, look forward to an update. Um, thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. And are there, um, okay, just to go ahead. Hi, can anyone, can everyone hear me? All right, yes. can you hear me? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question about play structures and what the latest advice is, especially for uh, young children having access to the play structures on school grounds uh, during school time. So during school time, uh, we're trying to restrict the use of play structures to one cohort at a time. Uh, we don't want the gathering of multiple cohorts there. We're trying to keep kids cohorted at uh, break times as best we can. So uh, that is being uh, that has been or is being introduced uh, either this week or we started last week. I just can't recall uh, the uh, the use uh, during recess time of play structures if the school is able to provide the kind of supervision needed to ensure that it's being used by one cohort at a time. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy Bell. And seeing no further questions uh, on uh, the director's update, thank you very much, director, on that update. We're moving on in the agenda to item um, 8.1, report 21-065, Westwind Public School, Fernbank Area Elementary Interim Accommodation Measure Number two. So, uh, Madam Director. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, I will do, uh, ask uh, CFO Carson to pick this up and uh, he'll hear it, share the report uh, and uh, entertain any questions. Uh, and uh, Manager uh, Ostovichuk has also joined, uh, who uh, is one of the leads on, on this conversation. Thanks, Mr. Chair. We will, I'm going to ask uh, Karen to introduce the report. Uh, we have s continued to see uh, the growth in the Fernbank area of the city that we've discussed over the last two or three years. Some of the measures that we introduced to relieve um, crowding at um, John Young, we had identified, uh, would need some modification as time went on. That growth has uh, continued. And as most of you know, the approval for um, the new Fernbank school was not received in time for us to be able to have that school ready for this fall. Um, we did try to monitor things in May and June. Um, however, it is clear that we need to um, uh, reduce the amount of growth um, that's continuing to occur at that school. Uh, we do have some physical uh, restrictions on it. And so I'll just ask uh, Karen to take you through it and uh, we, uh, we can respond to questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna keep this uh, fairly brief. Um, you have a very detailed report in front of you, but I know that you are very pressed for time. So um, my brevity is not a reflection on the seriousness with which we take this, but it is a, um, a complex, but fairly straightforward way forward on this report. Um, as uh, CFO Carson indicated, we've had continued growth in Fernbank. We've watched this carefully. Uh, back in 2020, uh, kids who were uh, directed to John Young Public School, we were experiencing a good deal of crowding there. Uh, we attempted to alleviate that pressure by um, creating a boundary for the new Fernbank School 
and ensuring that those uh, children by and large, uh, other than those who would be grandfathered at John Young, uh, would carry on at West Wind uh, Public School. Now West Wind is feeling the pinch of this growth. Um, certainly the numbers that are predicted in the report, we haven't achieved them yet this year, but we are concerned with the, uh, the numbers that we see at West Wind. And because of the nature of this development, we have house closures and occupancies through the year. So we know that that school population is not static as of account date sometime in September. It will grow throughout the year. What we are uh, proposing and what we've recommended in the report uh, with the significant background is to take any new student moving into what is the Fernbank catchment who would now be directed to West Wind. And as of uh, early October, we have a set date in the report, direct those children to Stittsville Public School instead. There are uh, grandparenting clauses within the report and recommendations that would see those, uh, those students who are grandfathered at John Young remain there, uh, that grandparenting would, would carry on. And for those at West Wind, the same thing. Uh, for this particular interim measure, there wasn't a significant amount of consultation that was done. Uh, that was for two reasons. Really, there is an urgency to dealing with this. And secondly, we have gone through the report um, on pages three, four, and five, We've tried to give you an exhaustive list of things that we've looked at as alternatives in order to deal with this growth. And really, uh, we do think at the end of the day that having students redirected to Stittsville Public School seems the most um, uh, plausible thing to do. And we look forward to having Fernbank uh, now, given that the, the funding was announced in June, having it built and having everyone uh, those uh, children who are uh, still at John Young, those at West Wind, and those who will be going to Stittsville uh, consolidated under one roof. Um, with regard to the, the consultation, there was some. We did go out to the impacted schools, John Young, Stittsville, and uh, West Wind, uh, to let them know of this report. We also did go out to uh, community associations in the area. We have received some feedback um, back on this matter. I have to be frank, most of it was to uh, inquire, how does this impact my child who is already at this school or that school? Are you moving them? And again, I wanna be clear, we're not looking at, at uprooting and moving students who are settled in schools now. We are looking at new families moving into the area and where these uh, children will be directed uh, as, as they would be going to a new school regardless. So there were a number of questions uh, of that ilk. Um, there were also some comments with regard to the numbers that remain at John Young and the numbers at West Wind. And so people were um, not pleased with those numbers, but pleased to see that we were uh, taking action to, um, to alleviate some of this pressure. I think um, Mr. Chair, I'll leave it at that, but I, I will be happy to answer any questions that arise. Thank you very much. And we do have uh, Trustee Scott on the speakers list. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I don't dare put my video on in case I lose my internet again. Um, for, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank staff for bringing this, this report forward. Uh, it is a difficult situation given the number of houses that seem to go up just about every night overnight in the Fernbank area. And uh, many of them have families with, with young children. Uh, so I will move the recommendation on page five of the report onto the floor. But then I have a couple of questions. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the, the big questions that is, uh, keeps coming to me is how, how overcrowded is, um, is John Young this year as compared to West Wind? Mr. Chair, through you, John Young remains um, more crowded than we'd like to see it. Um, but at least that um, ongoing growth has, uh, has stopped. I believe, if, I'm just looking at my numbers now, I believe they're at about 120% uh, utilization. So that is, is not ideal. Um, but when you compare that to West Wind at 150% utilization, 
uh, it's certainly a more manageable thing. Thank you for that. Uh, and the other question uh, relates to some of the inquiries I've had from parents uh, of children who are already registered for kindergarten at West Wind who live in the Fernbank area. They would be new students to the school this year. Um, some of them have said, well, couldn't we just send our kids to Stittsville Public School too? Uh, are we going to have any uh, flexibility if people want voluntarily to make a switch over to Stittsville um, without being part of the group that would be directed to Stittsville Public after the 4th of October if this motion is approved? And if, if we did have people who voluntarily said, okay, we'll go over to Stittsville instead. Uh, would we be able to provide them with transportation and treat them as if they were part of the redirection as opposed to treating them like regular student transfers with no student transportation? Um, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, Superintendent Newman is, uh, is about. I know there have been some discussions with some families uh, with regard to, to moving uh, to Stittsville. Uh, and that is something that uh, we are working on at, at the moment to entertain, uh, should that be the case. We wouldn't want unbridled uh, movement to Stittsville Public School either. Uh, really, we, we uh, have taken into account uh, the numbers uh, of, of registered students, pre-registered students at West Wind for this year. Um, and so I uh, believe that that is, is being managed appropriately. What we are looking at is the ongoing growth um, that occurs throughout the years in these very busy development areas. And that's something that we think will be unsustainable at West Wind. So we are focused there. Uh, with, regard to, um, with regard to transportation, uh, a very good question. We've certainly, uh, very early on, we raised this issue with AUSTA. Uh, as has been spoken of many times already this evening, AUSTA is uh, experiencing a number of challenges, especially uh, in this uh, far west end. Um, I do know they do not have capacity to add extra drivers and extra routing, but they are going to be looking at extending routing where uh, that is possible. So. Um, as much as we uh, wish to provide transportation to all eligible students, we will be focusing here as well, as we know uh, that it's uh, an unusual situation, and AUSTA will do the very best that they can. Thank you for that. And I have a further question, and that relates to the extended day program at Stittsville Public, uh, because that is one of the third party run uh, extended day programs. And what I'd like to know is whether the EDP will also have capacity to take in additional students if we see significant additional growth from the Fernbank area moving into Stittsville Public through the year. As much as that is possible, um, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, that will be accommodated at the school. Thank you very much. That's all my questions for now. Thank you very much. And is there any further debate? And seeing none, no further debate on the motion, Trustee Scott, you need a wrap up? I think it's just very short. And that is, uh, we, we, we are, I think that the start of construction on the new school is imminent. Uh, I'm still being told that we hope we will be ready for receiving students in the new school uh, next September. So this would indeed be a temporary measure, uh, but uh, something certainly has to be done to curb the additional growth at West Wind uh, because it is maxed out for portables and even some of the uh, teaching the teaching spaces right now are going to be in the library and gymnasium uh, not the greatest situation the the staff and the school community are uh, very resilient and and pe people are managing pretty well but there certainly is a great deal of community concern about the the extent of uh, the the crowding at West Wind this year so I hope my colleagues will support the recommendation. 
Thank you very much. And I'd like to call the question on this, uh, approving the motion as written. All those in favor? And opposed? And that passes, thank you very much. Moving on to report, or sorry, uh, agenda item 8.2, report 21-069, supervisory offer selection process. Uh, Madam Director, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, trustees uh, and uh, co the community will be aware that um, we did have um, a, uh, an unexpected uh, move uh, from of one of our members of our senior team. Um, uh, Superintendent uh, Hardy moved on into a different role in a different district um, and creating a vacancy uh, that uh, we now need to seek to fill. Uh, and so um, what trustees have before them is um, the report uh, seeking um, the the, uh, uh, support for us to uh, proceed uh, with the selection process for a supervisory officer as, uh, as um, provided by the uh, named uh, policy uh, identified uh, in the report. Um, we do want to signal to trustees that recognizing that um, typically a decision that is made here uh, in Committee of the Whole um, is uh, not a finalized decision until approved uh, at the board meeting at the end of the month. Um, but it is our intent um, that if it is that it is approved in principle, um, that we would proceed with um, posting for the position uh, beginning uh, tomorrow um, or shortly thereafter, as um, the timeline is um, is uh, uh, a protracted timeline for a process of this nature. Uh, we also do um, recognize that uh, we do have a uh, uh, trustees plan advisory uh, role uh, in the selection process. And there is a um, uh, trustee presence uh, on the committee from the, um, uh, from the point of view of the advisory role. And we did have a trustee, a trustee committee um, supported by the chair uh, for the last selection. Um, but uh, we do recognize that it is upon the approval uh, in the finalized approval in the board meeting that such a, uh, a, a representation uh, would be established. And so that would not be the conversation tonight. Uh, what we do need, however, is and we're seeking approval uh, from um, trustees for uh, proceeding with the process to um, replace uh, the uh, trustee who or the superintendent who has vacated the role. Thank you very much. And do we have a mover for this motion? Trustee Campbell? Trustee Campbell, would you like to have any introduction to this motion? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions? Ms. Lamb? Yeah, I, I have a question. So um, how was the equitable hiring policy that was recently revised or, or whatnot, um, does that apply to this, um, to this position? Thank you, through Chair, yes, it does. Okay, and has that actually been reflected? Um, like, because that policy talked about selection boards being diverse, um, and going through a process to perhaps looking to see if you have any gaps. So before you post, you would want to see if you have any gaps, uh, and then you may want to be uh, trying to recruit um, somebody from the from the underrepresented within that you know within the superintendents. Has that process happened? Yeah, so thank you through you, Chair. Um, in the uh, absence and the run-up to um, this uh, this report coming forward, we certainly have already started that conversation. Um, and so, um, are you hearing me okay? Uh, you, you look like you were having trouble hearing me. Um, so yes, uh, we have actually uh, started uh, to do that. We uh, engaged a third party uh, last time um, in uh, this process, and we expect to undertake uh, the same thing uh, because we what we found was uh, the engagement of a third party uh, involved 
involving um, us, uh, there was a, um, a good deal of um, uh, external critique um, that was being offered uh, around some of the aspects of our process uh, to enable us to be, in fact, more, more um, uh, uh, consistent with the directions that our um, human resources, uh, or sorry, our recruitment, our equitable recruitment policy uh, does indicate. Um, so to tell you that um, we've arrived at um, a foolproof uh, practice uh, would uh, be uh, uh, not accurate, uh, but certainly um, by engaging with someone who is external to us, um, we have had some good critique uh, and some good redirection on that piece. So uh, to your question, uh, Ms. Lamba, certainly yes. Uh, even in the absence of the uh, the direction here, we've already started with that process, recognizing that um, there are areas where uh, we need to improve. I, I appreciate that because when I look at um, the proposal, I don't see how like perhaps it would be your selection committee is going to be diverse um, because you're gonna have people from the trustees and you're gonna have senior, um, uh, senior, um, the, the senior, senior staff. Senior, yes. Yeah, the senior staff, sorry. Um, and you're gonna be able to have a diverse pool of, uh, of a selection board. And then the other thing is, are you going to be going through the process of figuring out whether you, and I'm gonna use the word designate, the position for a particular underrepresented group um, because that process, then you take applications just from that. So you don't get sort of biased if you get it from everybody, right? And then you screen those people out. So are you designating the position um, having gone through a process of, of seeing if there's a gap? Yeah, so thank you through you, Chair. Uh, no, we're not going to be doing that. Um, this is a, um, this, pa this particular position, as you are aware, um, there are only uh, 12, 12 superintendents. Uh, so the team is tight and small. Um, and um, there are some uh, explicit uh, qualifications that are required um, through uh, the Education Act uh, for uh, the filling of this position. Uh, so what we've tried to do is as, be as elastic as we can be um, in, in um, those requirements. So one example of that that, uh, is that uh, the role requires um, a, to be a supervisory officer. You require the supervisory officer qualification uh, program completion. Um, some districts require that that position, that program is completed uh, before application. Uh, in our case, what we are doing is we are uh, posting the position um, and indicating that candidates need to be qualified to start the, the, the program. So they don't have to, in fact, uh, have completed it. Um, um, because it is, uh, it is a program that is somewhat rigorous and um, it does take a little time, um, but we need to know that people are at least qualified to be able to undertake it. But what that does is it opens the space uh, for people who may have not have undertaken that, um, that uh, training yet to also be considered um, and therefore opening the field. Um, we've also um, made sure too that um, we've, we've started outreach and um, through our uh, through our uh, the third party that we're not only looking internally here uh, in the OCDSB at people who qualify uh, for uh, the position, but we also are, um, uh, we did and uh, we've started to and we're working with the, um, uh, the search firm uh, as well. We've spoken to the search firm as well about considering reaching out to organizations that um, engage with people who are either in the training um, or pursuing or capable of pursuing the training uh, in other districts um, and indeed across the province. Um, so we're really trying to ensure that the net that's cast is quite wide um, and the outreach, uh, the outreach is not passive, but active. Um, and, um, and so that way, what we, we're doing is bringing forward um, more, um, a, a more diverse pool uh, of candidates. And just my final question, I, I appreciate your answers. Um, and my final question is, um, I mean, I'm going to guess, I, I could be completely wrong, that um, some of the equity groups that are underrepresented uh, probably haven't been using that route. Is there is the board thinking of like mentorship or creating spaces for, you know, prospective people that could get into those kinds of positions um, or, you know, um, provide sort of a step ways to get to get to that. Uh, just in case, for example, in this particular recruitment, 
um, you may not get somebody who might who comes from the underrepresented groups. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And that is the, um, it, it goes to the pipeline question. Um, and so if you don't prepare the pipeline, you don't actually get readiness to be able to have people in the role. So absolutely, uh, this is a conversation that not only are we undertaking in the OCDSB and have been undertaken since last year, um, but in fact, it is a, a conversation. I sit at a table with um, a, a group that is uh, undertaking this very conversation provincially. Um, and so what we do see is we see that because these roles um, are, are uh, the, the teams uh, of senior teams are quite small uh, in most districts, um, the positions are few. Uh, and so seeing people move from, from uh, district to district is not unusual. And so ensuring that we um, not only have um, that push to how do we engage people in the learning and preparation in our own district, but how do we contribute to that from a provincial point of view as well. Thank you. And I just wanted to follow up on your selection board. How are you ensuring that's representative? Um, so when you say that, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. I'm, I, I guess it's actually called the selection committee. Yes. Right. Um, how will you ensure that is um, representative and diverse? Okay, so from the point of view of the um, the way that the, the, the committee is constructed, uh, the committee is constructed with uh, three members of the senior team as the decision makers. Um, I sit uh, on that uh, on the selection committee, um, and I chair the selection committee. Uh, the uh, the three trustees who sit, the uh, chair of the board uh, sits uh, on the committee, uh, and two other trustees are are able to uh, join. Um, so we have seen. Um, of varying degrees of uh, representation uh, at the table um, from a variety of different uh, identities. What I have tried to do in terms of the selection um, or the representation from the uh, senior staff um, is, is to try to uh, invite the different members of the senior staff because it is also uh, an opportunity to grow capacity around mentorship as well. Uh, when it is that we see different members of the senior staff have partaken in, in the process. Um, so that has been a bit of a departure uh, from um, past practice, um, where you know we now see a rotating uh, representation uh, on the um, on the uh, uh, selection committee from the point of view of the senior team, uh, and where it is that we can see that kind of representation from the uh, board of trustees, uh, it is certainly an opportunity that we encourage. Okay. Thank you, and I promise this is my last question. And will the selection committee have? Uh, training for biases or anything like that before they uh, go on with the, the selection. That's, yes, sorry, and that is my last question. That's one of the things that uh, we actually um, had tried to get into place uh, the last time, but we had to move fairly quickly and we were unable to achieve that. And so certainly as we go into this process, um, and indeed today we had a conversation about another uh, important selection process that we're undertaking and that exact conversation and commitment um, has been um, and tabled. Uh, so yes, indeed, uh, we are certainly pursuing that to ensure that um, again, you know, training doesn't solve every problem, but it certainly does bring us to uh, some common understandings about what we expect to practice when we get into that space. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Moving on to Trustee Boothby. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at this motion and I was one of the trustee members on the selection committee and I'm not going to be able to make the commitment for the next uh, selection. So I think we're gonna have to strike uh, part B out of this motion. So I guess I'll make a, an amendment that we just strike part B rather than spend a whole bunch of time here at this meeting um, trying to fix this. And we'll just have to um, find a, another trustee or two. I'm not sure if the other trustees are able to continue at uh, board. And maybe Thank I'll you. just ask, ask uh, staff if, uh, if we should strike it or what is your advice on the motion? 
Uh, thank you through you, Chair. Um, I think that um, that uh, we actually had had a discussion about this and um, had intended um, to simply uh, go with A and the, that we had actually assumed that we would have a new committee, um, new staff representation, as well as new trustee separate uh, representation um, going into the new school year um, with this new selection process. So uh, if it is that um, we are able to do that without too much fanfare, um, simply striking a, um, and then uh, we would be going through the practice in board of establishing uh, a new committee. And I think Chair Scott may have a comment about um, our practice here. Chair Scott? Thank you. Uh, uh, not sure whether the best thing to do is simply to strike Part B. I mean, certainly we should we should go ahead and and do the authorization piece under Part A. Uh, I think, but in terms of Part B, uh, perhaps what we want to do is to amend it so that it is, is so so that the board confirm the membership the, the the trustee membership of the selection committee at its at its uh, next board meeting. So given that trustee Booth Bay, do you still want to amend by striking part B? I'm fine to uh, go with what uh, Chair Scott has recommended. So I'll yield my time to her. Thanks. No problem. And is that so I'm moving that as an amendment, Mr. Chair, if I may. Okay. All right. And um, with e every amendment, unfortunately, it's uh, incumbent upon me to insist that the wording be put somewhere so that the other trustees can see what they're voting for exactly. And so at this point, it's maybe suitable for us to call a a very quick uh, 10 minute recess so that uh, so that if you could organize the wording, Trustee Scott, is that uh, suitable? Actually, Mr. Chair, we have wording up on the screen right now. I think it should say the board confirmed the trustee members of the selection committee. And then maybe we can vote on it before or deal with it before we um, before we have our recess. Okay, so uh, would you like introduction? Uh, none required, Mr. Chair. I just hope it's friendly. Okay. Um, and is that uh, if it's not friendly, please raise your hand or speak up. And it does look like it's friendly. So I'm gonna call the question on it. All those in favor of the amendment? And opposed? And that passes, thank you very much. And Trustee Boothby, you still had the floor on the main motion. Uh, I'll just um, put the motion on the floor and no introduction needed. I think um, the director through her questions and answers um, did a fine job of introduction. Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much. I believe it was uh, Trustee Campbell actually that uh, put it on the floor, um, but I did have uh, Trustee Ellis on list. Did you wish to make a comment or a question, Trustee Ellis? Uh, it was cleared up about the selection committee members. Thanks. No problem. And with that, turning it back to Trustee Campbell for any comment or wrap up. None required. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to call the question on this motion. All those in favor? And that's 12. So it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And I, I sort of hate to do this, but we do need to have a quick break. So let's take, it's uh, just looking at my clock, 9.03. So let's come back at 9.10 so we can uh, tackle the, the next item. Thank you very much. And I'd like to continue our meeting uh, starting from 
Agenda item number 8.3, notice of motion, re request for vaccine requirement for eligible students. I'd like to call upon Trustee Lyra to introduce the motion. Can everyone hear me? Hello, everyone. I am aware this is a contentious issue. This is not a decision to be undertaken lightly. I moved this motion because we have a significant population of students under 12 who are unable to get vaccinated. We also have a disproportionate number of students who are immunocompromised in Ottawa compared to most boards in the province because we have CHEO. And many families move here if their children have complex medical needs. Students with cancer and other immune system destroying conditions who are, we are required to accommodate by disability law, not to mention the kind of morality we try and teach our children. It is these students who are most at risk and necessitate going above and beyond the provincial minimum. COVID might have a death rate in the low single digits, but among students with comorbid conditions, that risk is significant. To boot, death is not the only risk. There is growing evidence that long-term COVID systems persist in many young people, even in children. I am certain you have all seen the news about how cases are racing through our French sister boards because they started school before we did. And while I wish we had gotten to this discussion earlier, it is better late than never. We sought legal opinions, the summary of which have been released to the public, which talks about how we both have the legal authority to implement such a policy and about our responsibility in loco parentis, the legal obligation to act as a cautious or prudent parent would when children are in our care. If you had multiple children, one of whom had complex health needs with the means, uh, which means they could not be vaccinated, a prudent or cautious parent would do whatever they could to protect that child. I believe the dates in the motion are reasonable and should stay where they are. This timeline leaves more than two weeks before the 31st to get the first shot and eight days for the second if someone left it to the last possible day before they complied, as November 20th is more than 50 days after September 30th. Medically, 28 days are required between the first and second shot and a further two weeks are required after the second shot to achieve full vaccination. Many of you will have gotten the same emails and phone calls that I have from a minority of vocal people who argue about the efficacy of masks and vac vaccinations, who argue about the very low risks that outweigh the benefits, who have, brought, who have bought into conspiracy theories about alternative cures. The ones you may not have gotten were the emails I've gotten from relieved families and parents who thank me for trying to protect their children. The ones who are worried about the health of their seven or nine-year-olds or a child who has health conditions and cannot be vaccinated. In the absence of specific provincial directives, I, or shall I say with the provincial directives being intentionally vague, we are left to work with limited guidance. If the province will not act to protect our vulnerable children, we must. I do not believe the province will act to mandate vaccines. I do not believe the province will amend the ISPA to include the COVID vaccine. I think we are on our own. And as the ministry has put this on our desk, we must act. I know this isn't what many of you feel you signed up for when you ran. Who could have seen the pandemic coming? But here we are. The ministry dumped this on our lap and we cannot kick the can down the road. We cannot pass the buck and we cannot do nothing. I refuse to sit on my hands while we put children at risk, but I have now spoken at length, so I will leave you with this. This is not a universally popular decision. There are some people who have written to me to insist they will never vote for me again, and if you support this motion, you would probably lose their vote too. But if we pass this motion and even one fewer child gets long COVID or dies, and the price is that I never get elected again, it will have been worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Lara. And we do have a speaker list starting with Trustee Fisher. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, I can't see the clock, so you might have to help me with uh, a timing reminder. Um, but I first want to start thanking Trustee Lara for bringing it forward. Obviously, um, I certainly feel as a parent of three, it's important for eligible students to be vaccinated. In fact, um, as the president and CEO of CHEO, uh, who I spoke with today on this issue, told me um, he firmly believes that everyone in school buildings should be vaccinated. Education, which we're gonna talk about later, uh, is key. Um, and I'm certainly supportive of that, um, You know, especially as there's so much misinformation swirling around on the internet on this issue. Mandating vaccines is more complicated as we learned in the legal opinion provided to the board. I don't think it's as cut and dry as Lyra has indicated. We've certainly, we're told that there are 
constraints and some limitations and some obstacles in terms of recognizing the fact that um, children do have a right to attend school under the Educa Education Act and other acts. Second, uh, we were told that the immunization of school pupils is governed by the province of Ontario um, with input from health experts. Um, and so those two facts are certainly influencing my views on this motion and whether or not we should be the first mover or give the province an opportunity to do ultimately the right thing. But make no mistake, I certainly believe that increased vaccination rates um, are required and we need to achieve uh, high rates to achieve um, immunity in our community. Um, I certainly want to thank all of our employees and students who have gotten vaccinated. Um, and I certainly want to recognize the parents and students who are hesitating um, and are being cautious. And the only thing I would say to them is, you know, reach out to your family doctor and talk to your doctor, get the right information. Uh, but it's okay to be hesitant. But ultimately, the benefits of vaccines outweigh the risks in many ways. For those who believe that vaccine mandates, mass mandates, vaccines, you know, are infringing on your rights. Um, I'm not sure if it's because perhaps you don't believe in government and being told what to do by government or you don't trust government. But there's an old saying, your liberty and your rights ends where my nose begins. And our human rights laws reflect that. They balance rights to non-discrimination and civil liberties with public health and safety. Um, and they certainly part. provide limitations uh, when there are serious pandemics in terms of um, how those rights are protected. Um, but I think overall, um, I'll certainly listen to the debate, but my sense is that I would prefer the province be the first mover on this particular issue, but I'll certainly listen to the debate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Trustee Fisher. And we're moving on to uh, student trustee Chen. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is definitely a very difficult decision to make. Um, before I start, I'd like to say that um, I am a high school student um, and I am fully vaccinated. And I would encourage all of those eligible students to be uh, fully vaccinated as well. Um, and the main concern I have with this motion is that it is preventing unvaccinated students from attending school in person. It's really important to keep in mind that students may not be vaccinated for a variety of reasons and not just ignorance or misinformation from the student themselves. It really isn't fair to prevent students from in-person learning because of the decision that some students may not even be able to make for themselves because of their parents. And so um, student trustee Salam Alada and I have worked together to um, put forward an amendment uh, that we will suggest which we believe will allow for parents and students to be able to make their own decisions regarding COVID-19 vaccination while also keeping schools safe. And so I'll, I'll suggest the uh, motion uh, under uh, exercising my rights under the Education Act, Section 55.4, a student trustee is not entitled to move a motion, but is entitled to suggest a motion on any matter at a meeting of the board or one of its committees on which the student trustee sits. And if no member of the board or committee, as the case may be, moves the suggested motion, the record shall show the suggested motion. And so I am going uh, to copy and paste it in the chat right here. Um, um, and it says that students eligible, uh, this is an amendment to the original motion, that students eligible for COVID-19 vaccination who are not fully vaccinated against COVID-19 by 20 November, 2021, be required to undergo regular testing for COVID-19. And so the main rationale for this, uh, to give trustees a reason for why they should move it on behalf of us, is that although students 12 to 17 are capable of making their own health decisions, they still face immense pressure from their parents and guardians. There are some students who are unable to receive the vaccine because their parents prevent them from doing so even when the student themselves wishes to receive the vaccine. For example, they may refuse to give health card information or threaten their child if they receive the vaccine. And any student who would go behind their parents' back to get the vaccine will face serious consequences. Furthermore, in-person school may be used as a safe space for some students to escape from household troubles and preventing unvaccinated students from attending in-person schooling can be very detrimental for some. 
Ultimately, preventing unvaccinated students from accessing in-person schooling is not fair for students. And we also know that in-person schooling is the best way for the vast majority of students to learn. And so I really hope that everyone agrees that this amendment is a good compromise between keeping students safe while also appreciating the complexities of vaccinating 12 to 17 year olds. I really hope uh, a trustee will move uh, this amendment on behalf of us. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, student trustee Chen. Moving on to trustee Schwartz. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to student trustees uh, for bringing forward um, the uh, proposed amendment. Uh, I won't be moving um, this proposed amendment, but uh, I do want to thank them for it. Um, I also just want to thank um, uh, Lyra. Uh, for bringing forward this motion and and for really pushing us, I think, to this debate. And uh, I'll, I'll echo uh, what uh, what Trustee Fisher has said. I won't repeat anything he said as he said it so very eloquently. But I do think it's important that we also look at um, at the situation that we're in right now. And and frankly, I'm I'm quite uh, upset with the province. Uh, angry, in fact, for not um, putting this uh, on the list of um, required immunizations uh, at this time and leaving it to school boards to make this decision. We are not medical professionals, although we do receive medical advice from our local public health officials and from many of the people that uh, individuals we may have reached out to. I myself have reached out to the regulatory um, uh, group at Health Canada, received an incredibly helpful information. I do want to cite a few things to debunk a couple of the things that we've heard already this evening. This vaccine is not experimental. Uh, while the Moderna and the uh, Pfizer vaccine uh, are the first of its kind to be rolled out to the public, uh, the technology behind them has in fact been developed over a number of years. Um, this idea of the clinical trials not being done until 2023, uh, again, debunk that. Uh, the estimation uh, or estimated completion date of clinical trials are the end dates for trials. This should not imply that these medical uh, or these clinical trials will in fact continue for this long. This is standard practice within the industry. So I, I think it's important that we also reflect on some of the, um, some of the information we've been hearing from the public. Um, and I also think that uh, I would echo what I've heard from Trustee Fisher that I myself have been vaccinated, my family's been vaccinated, we've made a decision to vaccinate our children, and we've done so uh, looking at the evidence and also thinking about public health measures across the system, protecting all of those that we encounter, those in the community that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, our neighbors, our, our church community, and, and others that we, that we interact with. And so uh, I firmly believe that parents should have the option, uh, but I also believe that the uh, population should be as vaccinated as fully as possible to get us out of this pandemic as fast as we can. And that is only going to happen the more and more people get vaccinated. So I'm, I will listen to the debate uh, this evening, like my colleagues. Um, I am erring on the side of asking the province to ensure that this is put onto the list of immunizations required for, for children to attend school. But um, uh, I want to see that happen quickly uh, because I don't want to be back here in a month from now debating this uh, yet again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Schwartz. And we're moving on to student trustee Salam Alara. All right. While vaccination is a vital part of, con of controlling the spread of COVID-19, there are many situations in which a student would be unable to get vaccinated, even if the student would like to be. Asking students to choose between getting in-person education and going against their parents' wishes, which might cause issues in the home, is unacceptable. After the past 18 months, many students have expressed that they, do not, they have been struggling with learning online to the best of their abilities. When the option to finally learn in person is presented and available, 
I don't think, I do think it would be cruel to um, deny that after all this time, especially for students who would prefer it. Uh, that is not to say that I am against vaccinations. In fact, I am a high school student who has been fully vaccinated, and I believe an anybody who is eligible should be vaccinated. And because of that, the OCDSB should do their best to um, put forward to educate and encourage students towards getting vaccinated. But in the event that students are unable to get vaccinated, they should be held to the same provincial standards of staff, meaning that if a student is unable to get vaccinated, they should have to go under uh, undergo regular testing. It has been a long time during this pandemic and everybody has been struggling, but with, with the way that um, this debate, sorry, it's been a long time with the pandemic and we're all trying to do our best to make the best decision possible for our students, but taking away a student's ability to learn in person because of a choice that might not be even be in their control is unfair to our students. I hope that uh, you all will consider um, moving the motion put forward by trustee Chen and I uh, for the better um, education of our students. Thank you. Am I frozen? No, go ahead, Chair Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, this is indeed a difficult decision. It is an important one for our debate. Uh, I have just a few points that I would like to make here. Uh, like, like others before me, I will not be moving the proposed amendment uh, that has been suggested by our student trustees, not because I think it is unworthy for us to consider, but because I'm not sure that it wouldn't be better for us to make a clean decision on, yes, we're going to mandate vaccinations for students, or no, we're not going to mandate vaccinations for students, and then decide what we're going to do uh, with regard to testing for any unvaccinated students. I believe that it is premature to be making a decision at this time to mandate vaccinations for eligible students. And I'm really concerned about the equity issues that would be associated with, with this move in terms of uh, students' ability to learn effectively uh, online as opposed to, to uh, being, being at school in person. And, just just recognizing that there are a lot of issues here that we are not really qualified to to uh, make make a decision on uh, because we simply do not have all of the all of the knowledge although i think all of us have done a great deal of reading of the scientific literature on this over the last uh, good while uh, the other the other aspect that i think is important to remember <laughs> is that uh, this vac vaccine is a little bit different from the ones that are currently covered under the uh, Provincial uh, Immunization of School, School Pupils Act uh, in that it, we, we don't know yet how, many, how often it's going to have to be repeated. Uh, right now for the vaccines that are on the list, there are uh, sort of schedules for administration and booster shots and so on, uh, which are pretty pretty tight. Um, I'm not sure whether this COVID vaccine is going to turn out to be more like our annual flu shots or whether it is actually something that is going to be much more lasting. Uh, so without, without having an understanding of where it fits into the scheme of our vaccination protocols for, for disease in general, uh, I would be very reluctant to say, yes, we're going to mandate uh, this and uh, direct all students who are unvaccinated into the virtual schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Scott. Moving on to Trustee Campbell. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So uh, I'll listen to the debate uh, uh, like others. Um, thought a lot about this, as we all have. And uh, I have gone back and watched the uh, the tape, quote unquote, uh, with uh, OPH and uh, uh, Dr. Malachny in particular uh, several times now. Uh, one of the uh, questions that was asked of him is, would he support something along these lines? And uh, the answer that I took, uh, extracted from uh, uh, what he said, uh, was that uh, they would discourage us doing that. And um, mentioned the uh, uh, legal primacy of the province in this regard, respect to ISPA. Uh, but uh, perhaps more importantly, he did mention uh, the equity angle. And uh, I, I took it, uh, perhaps reading too much into it, um, might impair their effort to develop relationships with communities and families. Um, uh, and at the same time, they were uh, uh, adamant, and they have been for a year and a half, but the importance of getting kids uh, back into school as much as we can, especially those who are marginalized. So uh, um, uh, I think that OPH takes a, um, a holistic view of uh, uh, public health. Uh, it's not just about uh, COVID, and they're concerned about mental health. They're concerned about developmental health. They're concerned about a whole bunch of things in terms of population health. And I uh, I certainly got the sense that when they provided us their advice, they were taking a lot of these factors into account, right? So um, throughout the year and a half of kind of considerations and motions around all this, um, I my North Star has been OPH. I've voted against um, asking uh, uh, kinders a year ago because OPH did not, was not in favor. I voted in favor this time because they changed and they decided that they were in favor. Uh, they very clearly indicated that they uh, would support us and were in favor if we could see our way clear to it, to a, a vaccine mandate for staff. When asked about students, they demurred and actively discouraged the idea. So without OPH support for the idea and the possibility we may impair their efforts, in fact, to drive up vaccination rates in certain communities amongst certain families. Um, I'm very reluctant to substitute my risk analysis, uh, uh, my medical opinion, uh, the potted reading that I've done uh, uh, for um, what should be the local public health authority uh, uh, expertise that we should be relying on here. So uh, I'll never say never, I'll listen to the debate, uh, but I don't think I'll be supporting this. In terms of the student uh, trustee uh, suggestion, I think it's a it's an interesting and, and clever way to try and uh, uh, thread the needle. I still do wonder about inequities with respect to uh, testing regimens. We've also heard from OPH that testing is rather ineffective. Um, and I do wonder about the operational concern about having that test large and track large numbers of individuals uh, in our amongst our 74,000 or so uh, uh, students. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Campbell. And moving on to Trustee Huff. So many things to say and only three minutes. Um, I want to say that I share the concerns of Trustee Scott and, and Trustee Campbell around um, the equity issues here. I think that we have to look at right now, we have a 90% um, vaccination rate amongst the children 12 to 18 in this city. That's 10% remaining. Who are those 10%? What do they represent? Who are they and why are they not vaccinated? That's a big question. Um, the answer to which we were not privy. We, we were not privy to that information. Um, and I think that it is imperative for us to think about what it would mean to say to those children, to those families that they must be vaccinated. I think um, Trustee Campbell hit it on the head in his, his uh, you know, reviewing of the, the comments from um, Ottawa Public Health you know, what are the what are the larger concerns around community engagement, community issues in our marginalized communities? Those communities of people where that might well be we're we're anticipating are represented highly in that ten percent of people who are not vaccinated at this point in time. What is the impact of a decision to those families for us to say, hmm? You must get your children vaccinated. If they are not vaccinated, you have to have them at home and they have to be schooled through a virtual system. Who are we asking to do that? Who are we asking to do that for 10% of all children? Now that's all 10% of all children in Ottawa, 12 to 18. That's not 10% of the children in the OCDSB. That's 10% of all children in Ottawa. 
So how many of them are our, are our students? How many students are we talking about and who are they? And we, we cannot know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very reticent to tell these families that they must vaccinate their children. I, I'm, my children are vaccinated and they are. That was my choice. That was their choice. Um, and I'm not sure how I would have felt had somebody come down to me and said, you must have your child vaccinated or they cannot come to school from this. At this point in time with the state of knowledge that we have in terms of the long-term impact of this vaccine. Um, so to the issue of the student trustee um, amendment to the motion, I think there are two things here. One is I believe it's a, a very excellent workaround um, for people to engage, to maintain these children in our, in our classrooms. Um, those kids that need to be there, how can we do this safely? Um, I think it's, I think the other part of this is that two students have shared with us from their perspective, how important it is that they be in the classroom, that students be in the classroom. They are speaking, you know, both of them vaccinated students themselves have said, we have to consider the, uh, the bigger issues here. And so I would like to put forward the amendment to the motion um, requested by the student trustees. Um, point of order. Go ahead, trustee uh, Lyra. So I do not believe the student trustee motion is in order because it undoes, it's functionally putting a knot in the middle of uh, the existing motion. The bylaws that we have say that amendments have to be in spirit of the the motion that has been put forward. And because vaccines are already optional and not mandatory, removing that clause undoes the entirety of the motion. I was wondering if uh, Manager Giroux was uh, online and can uh, make a comment uh, about uh, the fact that the student uh, amendment would negate the original motion or would it not? Uh, it's a good question, and uh, Trustee Lyra has done a good job of explaining the parameters for an amendment. I haven't had a chance to look at the two of them side by side, and I don't know if Manager Guthrie can put it back up on the screen so that we can look at it. I appreciate the point uh, that was made about the concern, and it may well be valid. I just uh, like to read it before I say that. So I do believe that. Uh, Lyra's original motion, Trustee Lyra's original motion is at the top and that the students wish to um, amend the motion by substituting the wording down below. I believe that's what they were suggesting. I believe that is what Trustee Huff is. Uh, right, and, and I agree with Trustee Lyra that uh, it's contrary to uh, clause A, to what would be the first clause. So if a were to pass and B were to pass, there would be a conflict in the motion. So uh, it could be raised as a separate motion, but not as an amendment to this motion. All right, so Trustee Huff, I'm gonna rule that uh, that amendment is out of order. You certainly have the right to challenge a chair if you do not feel that is the case, but that is my ruling. No, I respect your uh, ruling, sir. No problem. Um, and I think we, used up all of your time unfortunately but but based on um the fact that we probably went over a little bit did you have anything else the only thing i would add is that in this case can we hold students to a greater um standard than we're expecting from our staff that would be the only other thought that i would have about that thank you very much and we're moving on to trustee ellis Thank you. First, I'd like to state that I'm uh, supporting this motion. Um, one thing that hasn't come up is um, we're tasked with, you know, we want to have in-person schooling. The last time COVID comes into our buildings, either by a student being infected or uh, through contact uh, tracing, um, 
the, the more vaccinations, the less that happens, the more our schools will stay open. We're already seeing in some of the coterminous boards who opened um, earlier than us that they're um, having to close classes. Um, the other part is the um, uh, equity issue. And it's, you know, certainly there, there may be impacts. It was spoken that in marginalized communities, OPH is trying to, to up that rate. They haven't been successful. I don't know what they're what they have planned for in the future, but um, you know, there's no. I, I don't see any reason to think that they're going to crack that final few people who are vaccine hesitant without um, more of a um, impetus, which this motion, if passed, would give. Certainly, keeping in mind that certain communities may be impacted. I would hope that we would bring resources such as clinics in conjunction with OPH, Ottawa Public Health and the school board so that we can give clinics um, there. I understand how students um, may be in a difficult home situation where what they're wanting, they're fine with vaccination, but their, their parents aren't. It, we, we know it, when you're 12 or above, um, you have the ability, if a physician or a registered nurse thinks you understand the risk, they can vaccinate you. I understand how that might cause problems in a home and, and I don't want anyone to make an action that will put them at risk. That being said, for, it was pointed out 90%, I don't think we're quite at 90 yet, but we're up there. Why are we penalizing those 90% because 10% for whatever reason, don't want to be vaccinated. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. My advice, if I had children, fortunately mine are, are um, past school age and are vaccinated, but if I had children, I would be very hesitant to send them into a in-person situation where I wasn't sure that everyone who was eligible for, vaccinate, for the vaccination had been vaccinated. I'll end it there, I'm running out of time, but uh, I'll end it off with, I, I am supporting this um, motion. And I've heard from quite a number of parents who um, wish to be um, in a classroom where the majority, where the students are vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're gonna go to Trustee Boothby. Thank you, Chair. So I won't go over uh, what I agree with with uh, many of the speakers ahead of time. For me, um, I firmly believe in vaccines. I'm vaccinated. My entire family is vaccinated. I have quite a number of healthcare workers in my family, and they're all quite um, in support of vaccination. Where I have the difficulty with this motion and where I find I can't support it is we as a school board are tasked with the education and well-being of our kids. And if we're making kids go into online learning or making the environment of the schools a difficult environment for kids, we're not looking after their well-being and we're perhaps limiting children's opportunities for education. We've heard over and over again through surveys from parents and students that the last 18 months has been extremely difficult and their educational opportunities and their education have taken some hits. I don't think we can afford to do that. And as trustee Huff points out, there's around 10% of kids that haven't at least had one dose in this city. And as trustee Campbell points out, if, if the OPH is not recommending this, I don't know how I, as a not a medical person, can put forth, make it mandatory for children to do this. So I'm going to focus on the education and well being of children. And for me, the well-being is these kids need to be in school. They need not to be stigmatized. 
as Trustee Huff said, we have no idea why the 10% have not been vaccinated. Certainly some of them have medical conditions, but certainly some of them, it would be a difficulty in their home. And I'm not going to do that to children. I'm not going to put them in a situation where they're at odds with their parents. It's gonna to have to be an education thing from OPH or the Minister of Health in the province. But I don't, I can't force this on children and therefore be part of them perhaps having a lesser education. So I can't support this motion. Thank you very much. And if uh, uh, Trustee Scott, could you take the tear, chair so I can have my first time speaking uh, opportunity? Please go ahead, Trustee Penny. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna try to sum up uh, my thoughts based upon not only what I've heard before, but what I've heard tonight. And I would have to say that I'm fully vaccinated. I would encourage everyone to get fully vaccinated. I think that's one of the paths forward to getting rid of this stupid thing. However, I feel the motion put forward by Trustee Lyra is far too draconian. It doesn't give the staff room to accommodate anyone. There's too many exceptions to which it does not speak. Um, number two, um, it is prejudicial towards unrepresented, under, underrepresented students, which many trustees have spoken for. Number three, I think it's ineffective and impractical because I don't think the mere passing of this will cause all the unvaccinated students to rush out and get vaccinated. They have the reasons and, and um, I don't think uh, uh, us passing this is gonna make them do that. Number four, the tone um, is far too punitive instead of educational to me. Um, and I guess uh, I do not uh, wish to expose our board to any uh, further legal risks based upon the fact that we're out in front. You know, there's an old saying that you can tell the pioneers because they're the ones that have the arrows in their backs. Anyway, um, also, I think that it is probably um, best to leave it up to the province to, um, to um, talk about, uh, to, to carry this through. Thank you very much. If that's it, Trustee Penny, the chair back to you and uh, Trustee Blackburn is, is on for another first time speaker. Go ahead, Trustee Blackburn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to call the question. We have a motion to end debate um, by uh, Trustee Blackburn. Um, just wondering if, uh, um, I can't remember if that's debatable or not. Um, uh, Manager Drew, is that debatable? So a motion to extend debate, um, and uh, debate. requires two thirds majority and uh, it's amendable only with respect to the stated time number of speakers. It's not debatable. Okay. And so I'm gonna call a question then on that. Um, all those in favor of ending debate, And that's eight and opposed. And that's four. Uh, and so uh, um, the uh, debate has been ended and I'd like to turn it back over to Trustee Lara for wrap up. Excuse me, Chair. Yes. I, I'd like to request a recorded vote. Okay. I, I have to double check, Mr. Chair, but a recorded vote on a procedural motion is an unusual. No, uh, we're back oh, to the oh, main. on the final. Sorry, sorry, we're sorry. Back to okay. the main motion. My mistake. On the main motion, no problem. So, uh, Trustee Lyra does get her wrap up, though. So, I heard from a number of you a number of things. Um, I've heard that many of us want the province to take action including myself, if this wasn't on our desk, if the province had done something about it sooner, I think all of us would have been much happier people. Um, but I don't think they will. I think we're going to be sitting around this table in a month, in two months, in six months, 
having a discussion about why schools have closed twice in the past six months. And I think this motion would have given us the ability to keep schools open longer. It would have kept cases down. We've talked about equity. Something that I do not think you are all considering is that there is an equity lens in disability. The people who are immunocompromised have a disability that we are not accounting for if we do not pass motions like this to protect them. We need to do everything that we can to protect people who have cancer, people who have other conditions that destroy their immune system. It is an equity lens that we must consider when we want to talk about being a holistic equity-based board. Finally, I want to, to speak about well-being. I heard a number of people talk about the importance of having kids in the classroom and the importance of making sure that they get to, to spend time in person. We need to consider the long-term health impacts that having long COVID, having symptoms for years or decades will have on their overall quality of life. Not to mention if any of our children, heaven forbid, catch COVID and die. That, I would argue, does pretty negative things to the net well-being of an individual. And so I'm going to encourage all of my colleagues to support this motion. And if it doesn't pass, I'm going to be bringing it back for reconsideration because I don't think the province is going to do what we're all hoping they will. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to call the question on a recorded vote. Um, and so, uh, Manager uh, Bethry, can you help me with that? I sure can. Trustee Scott. Okay. Sorry, Trustee Scott. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm opposed, but I'm not. I thought our bylaws said that we do not have recorded votes in committee of the whole. They can be requested. I think they can be requested at budget, but not in our regular committee of the whole meetings. Man, our uh, executive officer, Drew, I wonder if you, I could call upon your assistance. I'm just looking. Um... Um, section D provo provides both and all uh, substantive motions at board are recorded, notwithstanding that. Um, uh, motion shall be, votes on motion shall be recorded only at the request of a member made before the voting commences. Uh, that winds them and I'm just double checking in the rules of committee. Uh, vote shall not be recorded in committee except by request of trustee at committee of the whole budget. Trustee Scott is correct. All right. So the ruling, the ruling is, is that it's only allowed at committee of the whole budget. And this is not committee of the whole budget. So uh, we, um, my ruling is that we're not going to have a recorded vote. Um, excuse me, point. Just, you know, if we were at the board office people could watch us and we'd raise our hands to vote under zoom we raise our hand are all those hands that are raised visible to the public portion of this meeting so what i'm getting at is normally there would be a recognition of who voted which way to those people who were in the room who wish to record it we're not able to do that here. I would say that this is a, an exceptional case that we're under in Zoom. And if there's a way for this group of trustees to be shown to the public as we raise our hands, I would be fine with that. If not, the workaround for that transparency would be a record, would be a, a to vote by rule. The so, uh, Mr. Chair, if it's possible for for staff to to live stream the entire screen with everybody showing, uh, I, I think that would satisfy uh, Trustee Ellis's concern, which I share. Uh, so, so I guess the question is to staff whether or not they can they can just do that instead of going only to this the live speaker.
or in what is actually being streamed. I'd be happy to put up my hand. I don't know why we're being jammed on this. We all agree that students need to be vaccinated. It's a question of whether the province does it or the school board does it. I don't know why we're being jammed on this by Chris. Yeah, I, I want, I want the public Guthrie? to know how we okay. voted on this. No, you don't. I, I, you want to jam your colleagues. Just wait, just wait. Yeah, please, yeah please. well, I, duh. Well, that's settle down, settle obviously. down. Obviously. Yeah, well, duh. That's well, collegial. you're, you're afraid, that's, you're afraid that's, for that's people collegial, to know Chris. what you're... If are you guys you, continue you to argue, I'm going to mute both it, of you. To be transparent on what your vote is on this both motion. Of you if you continue to argue. May I ask, I staff, <laughs> may I ask staff if uh, gallery view can be seen by the public on live streaming? Because yes, when you put a gallery view, I can see everybody who's voting. Yes, yes. it is possible. Thank you. Okay, so. So can you put it in a gallery and let me know uh, when we are in gallery view, please. On the live stream. Through you, Chair Scott, we are in gallery view now. Sorry, Thank Chair you very Penny. much. No problem. Thank you very much, Manager Guthrie. So, um, I'm going to call a question, as uh, Manager Guthrie has uh, stated. Uh, it's gallery view, so everyone can see when everyone hands hands is up. All right. So all those in favor of uh, the motion in agenda item eight point three. And opposed. and abstaining. So the motion is defeated uh, by a count of nine passed, two, or sorry, two, four, nine against, and one abstaining. And let's move on to item 8.4, notice of motion, access to school board property. And then call on trust trustee Lyra to introduce the motion. Uh, this motion was introduced and uh, debated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Point point of point of order, uh, Chair. Um, I believe that Lily Miller has a point of order to raise uh, to the attention of of the Board of Trustees. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Miller. Ms. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, um, I just want to uh, call to your attention um, the, the very racist comment that you made uh, when, while you did your, um, your comments. Um, and I just wanted to call this to your attention in this way. I don't know if anyone else um, even noticed it, but I just wanted to um, make this a learning opportunity perhaps for everyone. You said, you know you're the pioneer when you have arrows in your back. Yeah. Yeah, I yes. think uh, that was directed that? to you, Chair, Chair Penny, yes. Yes, it, it is, and I said it, and I very, very much apologize. I, um, um, it was uncalled for, and I'm very, very sorry, and um, uh, I said it, uh, on a whim of a moment, I very much apologize and I'm very sorry to everyone. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to item 8.4, notice of motion uh, from Trustee Lara. This was debated and discussed at, I want to say the meeting of the 31st. Uh, and we decided to put it away for this meeting on the assumption that we would get more text to change it somehow. We have not received that text and as such, it's coming back as is. Um, so I think that this needs to be, I'll summarize what I said last time. This needs to be introduced because we must create a wall around our vulnerable students, those who cannot be vaccinated. Um, and so we need to make sure that people who are coming into the school contractors, guests, 
uh, people who are not otherwise staff or volunteers, which are the two groups of adults that we currently require to be vaccinated, are also vaccinated. Thank you. And uh, we do have a speakers list, starting with Trustee Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have uh, difficulties with the motion as it's uh, currently structured and worded. Um, a, uh, uh, it's a policy, uh, it's just policy change as opposed to a directive outside of policy that's time bound in terms of how individuals are designated, uh, et cetera. Um, I did have a, a substitute motion I circulated to uh, uh, colleagues and to uh, staff, and I'm not sure if it's an order to move uh, that text in the substitution or not. I didn't really hear a word back. <clears throat> I would consider it friendly. So we don't have that text in front of us, Trustee Campbell. Um, uh, I, I just plunked it in the chat. So your amendment is to um, replace the entire text with this text. Uh, that would be correct, yeah. I, I, I was thinking about how I could uh, do microsurgery here and there, but I, I just couldn't see how to do it uh, and uh, turn it into something that I at least personally could uh, support. So. <clears throat> Can everyone see the amendment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we can see it. All right, so um, I give everyone a minute to read it because it is uh, lengthy and then I'll ask if it's friendly. All right, um, so if this is not friendly, I'd like you to please speak up or raise your hand. I have one minor sub amendment I would like to make, so it's not friendly. Okay, not friendly. So uh, Trustee Campbell, do you want an introduction? Uh, sure, uh, briefly, it uh, deserves some anyway. Uh, I think that we should, uh, um, I don't think this uh, po a policy change is the appropriate uh, vehicle in this in this case. Um, policies endure pretty much forever, not that you can amend amend them a, a, again, uh, but I think that a directive is, uh, which is more time bound uh, is, and you can see the, the, the suggested text there uh, is uh, more appropriate. Um, um, those who are familiar with the um, uh, ministry guidance on um, the uh, disclosure policy, et cetera, will recognize that uh, I have used verbatim the same groups who are bulleted uh, that the ministry has uh, uh, written to us on. Uh, the effective difference uh, 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 here is that um, there wouldn't be uh, uh, testing. The other thing is that what I would be looking at is um, uh, further restricting to those who are actually working with, with either our staff or our students uh, uh, directly. So this wouldn't include um, uh, 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 parents, it wouldn't include uh, contractors working on the weekends or nights who are not with uh, students and uh, staff. Uh, it wouldn't include some numbers, some classes of people that were in the original motion. Uh, this is really focused on ensuring the protection of uh, our staff and the protection of our students in terms of in, in 
active in-person work for those regularly visiting schools, which I, I believe is actually from the ministry, the word regulars from the ministry. So um, I'm really trying to put in something here, which I think uh, um, for us to be consistent, if we're going to bind our staff in certain ways, uh, in terms of uh, their working with students and working with each other, I think that we need to uh, bind others who are in exactly the same position uh, as volunteers or uh, professional support workers uh, of one kind or another uh, with respect to our students and our staff as well. I, I don't personally don't see how we can't do something along these lines, uh, but I think that it should be um, targeted. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And for that introduction, so we're going to turn it over to Trustee Lyle. Um, so I'd first like a staff comment on how, if we're going to have two policies, these are both impacting volunteers, uh, what impact that would have. Because we have, we passed a mandatory vaccination policy for volunteers two weeks ago. This is also for volunteers. And I'm wondering what the impact that's going to have. Uh, thank you through you, Chair. Uh, we have had some discussion about this. Um, there are some uh, operational uh, considerations here uh, because, again, uh, it's not just a question of, in theory, whether or not uh, it's a good idea. It's the capacity to actually implement it, monitor it, um, uh, and ensure that um, uh, we are uh, adhering to uh, the expectation. Uh, I will ask uh, Superintendent McCoy to uh, comment uh, because uh, she has been involved in this um, reflection um, because again, uh, leading the attestation piece, uh, Superintendent McCoy, um, would you uh, provide us with a comment? Sure, um, through you, Chair. Um, uh, in the development of a, um, a protocol or strategy, we would um, uh, consider volunteers and understanding that they that there is a previous motion, um, but I don't think the previous motion is inconsistent with this in the sense that it does require um, a mandatory uh, vaccination um, uh, protocol for our volunteers. Um, so if anything, it may be a duplication, but I, I don't read it as being inconsistent with the previous motion. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, then with that, I'd like to switch the word October to September to be in line with the rest of our uh, mandatory vaccination requirements. Our mandatory vaccin the vaccination for staff and volunteers are both set for the 30th of September, and I think this should be too. All right, so if this is uh, not friendly, please raise your hand or speak up. Uh, I have a Mr. question Cameron? in order to determine friendliness, Mr. Chair, I guess. I, I don't know. You can take that no either problem. way, I guess. Question, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, it goes, I guess, to uh, it's, it's a feasibility question to uh, uh, staff. Um, uh, if this is uh, uh, an anticipated, uh, uh, we don't approve this until board end of the month. So uh, I guess the question is, um, what is actually feasible? That's why I'd had October there. I'll again turn to uh, Superintendent McCoy for comment. Uh, thank you. Um, while we have been considering um, certainly the implementation of disclosure policy for non-employees, um, this would be an additional um, requirement. And while I think we would endeavor to be um, rolling the two into one, I, I am concerned that um, as we move forward, we may realize that we're just not able to um, implement both the um, um, the elements of the, um, the protocol for employees at the same time, um, or sorry, for this latter group at the same time as our employees, our, our efforts would certainly be with regard to employees, given the, um, you know, it's a much larger group. We know they're, they're, they are in the, um, uh, in our buildings. Uh, we have um, more restricted access in place right now with regard to access to our premises generally. And so while I think we would endeavor to try and bring it forward, um, I, I think just um, uh, speaking for myself would appreciate the flexibility of a, uh, of a later timeline, timeline uh, in the event that we um, do run into some um, concerns about implementing it. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I guess on that basis, it's not friendly for me, and I'll listen to the debate. Thank you. No problem. And um, um, I think we had an introduction by uh, Lyra for the reasons why uh, she wanted it to be September to be in line with the staff policy. But if you want further words, go ahead, uh, Trustee Lauer. 
No, I'm good. No problem. And are there speakers to this sub amendment? Trustee Ellen? Not really speaking to sub-amendment. It's, I guess I could have done it under a point of uh, order or privilege. Um, I'd like to request that all votes at the Committee of the Whole um, be done with the in gallery view for the public. Okay. Further comment on the sub-amendment, though? No? Thank you. And Trustee Scott? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think uh, what Superintendent McCoy has said regarding the uh, potential difficulty of implementation, uh, particularly because uh, these are people that we are not necessarily in regular in as regular contact with as as we are with our staff, uh, and we don't hold district records of them as as is the case for our staff. Uh, I think that. Uh, that for me is sufficient reason to leave the date as as it was in uh, Trustee Campbell's uh, am uh, amendment. Thank you very much. And seeing no further speakers to the sub amendment, going back to Trustee Lyra. I'm good. No problem. So I'd like to call a question on this sub amendment. All those in favor? Keith, can we see the text on the screen, please? Uh, yes. So the sub amendment just merely substitutes the October for September 30th. Okay, thank you. So all those in favor of the sub amendment? Are we in gallery view, Chair? Are we in gallery view, uh, Manager Guthrie? We're in gallery view. Yes, we're in gallery view. Thank you very much. So all those in favor of the sub-amendment? And opposed? And abstaining. And the sub amendment fails. And so going back to the uh, original amendment, and I believe that we had um, Trustee Scott and Trustee Blackburn. On, on, the, on the amendment? Yes, on the original amendment. I beg your pardon? Yes, on the original amendment. Sorry, on the, uh, on the on amendment, the amendment. Or, or, uh, because I don't think we've voted on the amendment yet. No, but we're speaking on the amendment right now. Okay, I was just I was just putting up that to say to say that the sub amendment was not friendly. So I don't need to speak right now. No problem. Thank you very much, Trustee Blackburn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. And I guess my question would be to staff, what does staff interpret as third party contractors? Uh, this is a discussion that we've all been undertaking. Uh, I'll turn to you, CFO Carson at this point, uh, because as you uh, know, there are there's a, uh, complex understanding of who it is that um, uh, accesses our building. So, so um, just, if I may, sorry, Madam Director, and through you, Mr. Chair, I apologize. So my main two concerns would be, uh, one is, it, does it include bus drivers? And secondly, would it include people who are um, doing um, maintenance uh, above and beyond what our normal um, staff would do and or uh, 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 construction type people who would be uh, doing upgrades to our buildings and such. Those are my, my two main, but if you wanna add uh, other people that could be of concern that I haven't um, thought of, I'm happy to hear about that too. Thank you, Thank Trustee you. Blackburn, that was clarifying. Uh, CFO Carson, please. 
I, I'm I'm sure uh, Superintendent McCoy will will be able to explain it better than I can. But we've already considered some of our contractors, for example, the uh, uh, the construction work and the renovation work that uh, that we're undergoing as much as possible. Um, that work is being sequestered away from students, and so under that, they would not necessarily meet that definition of regularly in contact uh, with staff or students, uh, and so we would feel that it probably would not apply to them. Having said that, we know the construction industry has put on an extremely strong um, uh, push to get their staff, uh, uh, their tradespeople vaccinated. We have for the same issue with uh, childcare. Um, our third party childcare operators, our uh, licensed childcare operators are operating under their direction from the Ministry of uh, education and their license uh, who who sets the rules for their licenses they are going through the same process that we did for disclosure and uh, there we will have to go away and take a look at some of the um, legalities of how we impose some of these on existing tenants um, but I, I suspect that uh, it would not apply to those uh, um, child cares as they are governed separately. Um, uh, but I know that Superintendent McCoy uh, it would want to be able to have time to look at this. And that's why that October 30th date was important. Good enough, Trustee Blackman? Uh, bus drivers. Just want to make sure they're not included. Uh, through, uh, through you, Chair, um, one of the things that's important for um, uh, the Board of Trustees to be aware is that um, there has, in fact, been directive that has come from the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, towards um, uh, uh, through the Ministry of Education around uh, bus drivers. So that um, piece has been undertaken separately uh, by uh, OSTA and, um, and other consortium across the uh, province. Uh, so similar to uh, what uh, F. Sufo Carson has indicated um, that where operators are in fact, uh, or sorry, uh, contractors uh, have all already undertaken their own direction to their staffs. Similarly, um, direction has been given that way uh, for that to be undertaken um, by the body of OSTA itself um, with the operators to the operators around uh, a whole compliance expectation. Thank you, Madam Director. Those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. And going to Trustee Huff. Yes, just a quick question to staff. I'm assuming that trustees fall under the category of OCDSB staff from the previous motion as we had to undergo the attestation. Is that correct? Okay, thanks. I just wanted to clarify. All right, thank you. And uh, seeing no further um, Questions going back to Trustee Campbell for wrap up of the. Oh, sorry, Trustee Lara, do you have a question? Um, our recorded votes are not being adequately recorded on YouTube. You cannot see the hands even in gallery mode. And I agree with what has been stated before. I think that if we want to be having recorded votes and public accountability, we need to be doing voice votes or nothing. I went and checked the YouTube video because someone flagged it with me. You can't see, you can't see who's voting for what. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, if I can just have a point of order here. We've been having, conducting our meetings via Zoom for the past 18, 19 months. This is the first time that this issue has come up. I understand the importance of demonstrating our votes publicly. But I think at this juncture in the evening, this really needs to be taken forward uh, to agenda planning and discussed at agenda planning uh, together with the staff and coming up with a solution for this. Uh, I think it's inappropriate at this point, after 19 months of doing meetings this way, that now we're suddenly realizing this. Better late than never. Agreed. Nonetheless, I think we need to have staff take it away. Thank you. 
Yes, I, I would agree. I think that uh, at this point, it is a technical problem that uh, is very difficult to solve. We've tried to solve it. Um, and uh, we'll have to take it away and see what we can do. So uh, any further comments on the amendment? Uh, uh, wrap up then, Mr. Chair, or? Um... Wrap up, Mr. Campbell, or sorry, Trustee Campbell. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, briefly, and try to address uh, uh, some of the comments concerns, I would assume um, uh, that uh, uh, staff, it goes without saying, it's like human rights legislation, uh, that uh, if there's superseding uh, ministry uh, directives or uh, other guiding regulation or legislation, staff would, as a matter of course, be taking that into account. So uh, I, I assume that into the picture. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, 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 I, I have narrowed, sought to, to narrow uh, uh, who, who's included here uh, beyond what the ministry is suggesting. So those bulleted uh, um, sort of classes of persons, um, uh, with respect to the ministry uh, 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 protocol, there isn't really a restriction on them. Uh, what I've done is I've sought to, because uh, the, the, the terms of the binding would be stronger here, um, is I've sought to uh, limit it to those who are um, not just uh, regular attendees on school premises um, uh, in person, but who are working directly in person with staff or students. And uh, my hope and expectations, I think the uh, um, uh, superintendent facilities may have uh, um, uh, talked talk to that, is that uh, at least large classes of uh, uh, contractors uh, those, um, uh, if we ever get back to it, heritage language classes and uh, events used at schools uh, would not be in included because they're not work, it wouldn't be people working directly with uh, uh, students or uh, staff in person on school premises. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to call the uh, vote uh, on this uh, motion, on the amendment. Um, all those in favor of the amendment? And opposed? Turn this chair, I meant to register my vote in favor. Doesn't matter, no one knows. <laughs> Now you do. And the amendment passes. And now we have to um, vote on the entire motion. As a, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we have to vote on the motion as amended. So all those in favor of the motion. Mr. Chair, I have my hand up to speak to the main motion now that it has been amended. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Trustee Scott. Thank you. And through you, I have one question for staff, and that is within within wording here, what actually would be different from what we are already expected to do under the ministry directive around vaccination attestations and associated uh, actions? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Madam Chair. I will ask uh, Superintendent McCoy to speak to that uh, because there are some complexities around how the material, how the attestation is um, collected, and um, how it is then that we are actually able to operationalize this with staff who are or people who are not regular staff uh, and regularly um, attending in our schools. So, uh, uh, Superintendent McCoy, could you venture uh, a comment? So um, as I read the motion, um, what would be different or what we would be looking at in addition to the um, current um, disclosure requirements, because as Trustee Campbell indicated, the, um, the groups which are set out here are already identified under the disclosure policy. So we are um, having to um, um, collect a, an, an attestation um, asking these non-employee groups to disclose their vaccination status. However, this would go further in terms of not only asking for, the, well, in addition to asking for their vaccination status, 
would be um, essentially barring them from access to the premises uh, unless they were able to or unless they attested that they were fully vaccinated and provided the appropriate proof of vaccination. And so um, we will need to implement processes which will ensure that anyone accessing um, uh, the building um, is able to provide that, um, that proof. Um, so that's what I would see as, as different. So going further than, than disclosing um, and then taking the steps that the ministry um, uh, policy sets out, we would be um, mandating a vaccination and so putting a, an additional requirement on these individuals. Thank you for that to answer. Uh, I guess the, the next question that, that I have then is whether it is expected that this could compromise uh, service to some of our students. For example, if we had a nurse who had been assigned to work with a medically fragile student who might not be vaccinated because they had a medical exemption, would they no longer be allowed to do their to do their work? So through you, um, Mr. Chair, I think those are some of the considerations we would need to make in terms of, for example, um, what are our obligations to these groups uh, under the Human Rights Code? So um, as a service provider, for example, we know we have certain obligations and as an employer, we have certain obligations. So we would need to, um, I think, consider what our obligations are to these different groups. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that um, the motion does include um, a statement specifically that says subject to such extraordinary individual exemptions as may be granted by authorized staff, which I think could provide um, discretion um, uh, to allow access uh, under certain conditions, um, depending on the circumstances, depending on the hardship, either in terms of the impact on our students or staff or on those um, um, categories of, of individuals who are covered by this motion. Thank you for, for, for that answer. Uh, th this for me is a very difficult one. It seems to me that we already had word salad from the ministry around what was mandated and what was not mandate, mandated and what exceptions there were and what exceptions didn't exist and who was included and who was not. And it seems to me that we are actually uh, contributing a new set of word salad, which sounds similar, but and uses a lot of the same words, but doesn't quite mean the same thing. Uh, I am concerned that that uh, there will be a great deal of confusion. Uh, I'm not sure whether whether this is the way we should be going on this one uh, at the moment, but I will certainly uh, uh, consider it if it is approved between now and the time of board. I think I will have to abstain tonight. Thank you very much. And we have, uh, Trustee Blackburn did have her hand up. No? Okay, so um, seeing no further um, comments on the main motion, uh, turn it back to uh, Trustee Lyra for um, wrap up. None required, thank you. Thank you, and therefore I'm gonna call the question on this motion. Um, all those in favor? And opposed? And abstaining. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm wondering if uh, I don't want to bend the rules, would it be uh, permissible to announce the, the vote count? Yes, it will. Um, yes, it can. Uh, the, there was uh, 10 trustees who voted for and two, a none against and two who abstained. I believe it was nine in favor. There was one snuck in right at the very end. Yeah, one's missing. 
Yes, yeah, so that was probably that was probably someone getting hit. So it is nine in favor, zero against, and two abstaining. All right. So right now it is uh, ten twenty nine, and uh, instead of introducing the next uh, uh, motion, I would like to take the ten thirty vote. And just as a reminder, I think the bylaw says that we need. Um, uh, if you could remind me, uh, Executive Officer Drew or my Manager Bethry, is it two thirds or is it a simple majority to continue past 1030? Through you, Chair, two thirds. All right. So all those in favor of continuing past 1030? And opposed? And so uh, we're going to continue and we're gonna uh, go to agenda item number 8.5, notice of motion, um, re letter of ministry advocating addition of COVID-19 vaccination to list of compulsory vaccines. And Christy Campbell, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, already. Yes. So there are two parts to this uh, uh, motion, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, basically, my motivation to bring this forward is to test, really, to be honest, our, our board's uh, alignment with uh, the public statements declarations of, of others. So the first, the part A, is a, a paraphrased version of uh, what I understand uh, OBSPA. Uh, the Ontario Public School Boards Association, of which we're a member board, uh, has called for. So I guess my question then is effectively, uh, do we agree that OBSPA is representing our board uh, as well uh, in its declaration or not? I note that uh, people for education have called for something similar, uh, as has the, the Toronto District School Board and, 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 and others. Uh, part B uh, is, again, uh, it's a uh, generally uh, reflective, uh, hopefully, uh, student trustees could speak to it if it's uh, in greater, uh, reflective of what uh, Asta ECO has called for. So uh, I think for me, this is a, a test of uh, our, what, are, what are we generally uh, supportive of uh, uh, here um, uh, so that we can uh, uh, be clear with respect to our, our views along the, the same lines. I will uh, note that um, the wording is slightly different. Uh, I'm not necessarily calling or I would suggest not necessarily calling for addition to the uh, ISPA. I'm, I'm calling uh, or suggesting we call for a, a, a non-political um, uh, uh, medical authority to determine whether uh, something should be added to the ISPA. I'm not entirely convinced myself. There are certain criteria, I believe, for whether something should or should not be inscribed on the ISPA. Uh, a lot of the measures that we currently have uh, incumbent upon us are actually pretty much copied and uh, drawn from the ISPA. Um, there are pros and cons with respect to an appeal procedure, etc. I think it has to be looked at. Uh, in terms of B, uh, we got a little bit into that uh, with respect to our uh, uh, own earlier debate. Um, uh, but again, uh, I don't feel I'm personally um, a competent authority to determine whether that should be imposed on, on boards. Um, it goes to some prior debate. And so I'm asking again, the competent medical authorities without political interference by implication, uh, consider the matter. And uh, so I'm suggesting that we stop short uh, perhaps of where the, of the ops position and the OSTA ACO position. Um, uh, I, for me, it's a little bit more than a formality. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we do have a list. Uh, Trustee Schwartz, you did have your hand up. You wish to speak? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Trustee Campbell actually answered uh, one of the questions I had of the mover. Thank you. No problem. Then moving on to Trustee Lyra. So I suppose I have a quick question and that is if we are adding it to the list of compulsory vaccines is it not automatically the list in the ISPA and if not what other list of compulsory vaccines is there so that sounds like it's a question for the mover do you have a response trustee campbell or or to lynn to staff? have to write the letter 
Uh, or uh, my understanding, sorry, if I, if I can be brief then, uh, I'll try and help. Um, my understanding is, uh, technically speaking, uh, the list of um, uh, diseases against which, uh, for which there has to be vaccination is not actually itself present in the act, right? That is a decision of whether, whether to list or not a disease outside of the act uh, as a result of a decision by the Minister of Health uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so um, I didn't necessarily want to complicate matters unduly here, um, but yes, the, my, my meaning certainly would be along these lines. The reason I asked is I have um, perhaps qualms, a good word, with the truck-sized holes the ISPA allows for uh, non-medical, non-code-protected grounds for parents who may wish not to vaccinate their children. Um, and so if this was asking to add it to the ISPA, I would perhaps suggest we rewrite it. Uh, if it is your intention that it not be added to the list in the ISPA, then I would be in support. And so I could, if I could get some clarification about whether or not that is what this motion is asking, that would be excellent. Mr. Campbell? Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I, I had thought, uh, yes, yeah, sure. So uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Lyra. There are big exemptions for statements of conscience, which are not currently in our current uh, ministry guidance. The ISPA is a different creature, which is why I'm not sure we do want to endorse the opposite position. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I think there are pros and cons. Um, um, Sorry, I lost track of the, uh, the, the, the question I was supposed to answer. <laughs> the question specifically was, is the letter we are writing endorsing that we add it to the ISPA or no. not? Okay. No. What, I, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that we ask the Minister of Education to ask provincial health authorities to evaluate whether it should or shouldn't be. And my aim in this is to try and remove the politics as to whether it should or should not be in the ISPA and leave that question to competent medical authorities. Would we not be better off directing that question to the Minister of Health? Uh, quite possibly, Mr. Chair, I don't necessarily want to enter in a debate here. It's trying to clarify, but uh, the, the uh, um, uh, uh, possibly, but again, I the Minister of Health is a, uh, a political appointee, and uh, I guess I'm, I'd be interested in getting um, uh, personally the views of the science advisory table and, and, and others on this. Anyway, thank you. All right, with the clarified information, I'm going to make what I hope to be a friendly amendment that we say to the ministers of education and health. That the chair write a public letter to the ministers of education and health to advocate for, et cetera. And so if um, I do have Trustee Ellis to speak on the motion, but uh, if the motion is not friendly, I'd like you to speak up or raise your hand. And seeing, um, seeing no hands or, or anyone speaking up, then I assume it's friendly. So. Um, uh, let's uh, call a question on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? Mr. Mr. Chair, what are you calling the question on? On the amendment where uh, Trustee Lara has put Minister of Education and Health. On the amendment? Yeah. Yes. And opposed? Okay, so it is amended and we, uh, Trustee Lara, you still have a, a moment or two? I think I'm good, thank you. No problem, Trustee Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, I, I will be supporting this. I guess a little bit's better than nothing. Um, I, I'm not happy with this. It doesn't go uh, far enough again. We're bunting it to some other people. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hold my nose and I'll, I'll uh, support this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ellis. Uh, going to Trustee Fisher. 
Yeah. Thank, thanks, Keith. And, and just to clarify, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't be using the words punting. I think we can all agree that we want students vaccinated, but I think based on, you know, our maybe differences in the interpretation of the legal advice we've received, some believe that this is a decision that should be made by the province. Clearly there are some who believe that this is a decision that can be made by the board. And so I don't think there's any dispute that we're all advocating for our students to be, to be vaccinated. It's a question of, you know, what level of government the board or the province should be doing that. So let's, let's settle that. I don't think there's any dispute that we, we all want our kids to be vaccinated. Um, in terms of the amendment in front of us, um, however, I do think that we should add a, a sub amendment to to respond to Rob's point about the science advisory table because I think it's a good one. And so I would propose that after provincial health authorities, we add the words and experts um, to make it a bit broader in terms of provincial health authority, which is the chief medical officer and perhaps um, local health bodies, but also experts, which could include the science advisory table, because the science advisory table in and of itself is not a provincial health authority. Um, so I think by adding the words and experts um, gives the latitude to consult others outside of the chief uh, medical officer and perhaps local health authorities in the province. Thank you very much. And if this, this uh, amendment is not friendly, please speak up or raise your hand. And it does look like it's friendly. So let's take the vote on that. All those in favor of the amendment? Nine in favor and opposed. Excuse me, Chair. I'm a little confused. It's friendly. So we're having a vote on it? Yes. If someone votes thing. against it, then it's not friendly. Yes, but it's just, just have to have the vote, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, the amendment passes and we still have, um, I think it's Trustee Scott to speak on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would like to ask if we can vote separately on parts A and B. Uh, I know that for all of the other vaccinations that are mandated, it is not the schools that hold the records of the vaccinations. Those belong with, with public health. And I am somewhat concerned about the potential for stigmatizing students who are unvaccinated for any reason if that information is held in uh is held by boards. And also, uh, I am concerned about our capacity to ensure that the health information, which is not part of our normal data collection on students uh, in our student information systems, I'm not sure that we have a secure way of managing that. So I will ask that we vote uh, separately just on parts A and part B. No problem, that is your right, Trustee Scott. And um, are there any further speakers to the motion? And seeing none, going back to Trustee Campbell to wrap up. Uh, very quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, share some misgivings uh, around B. Uh, I have misgivings around A. I think I've spoken to some of them. Uh, and this is why um, I'm not proposing we actually absolutely endorse one or the other, but ask for expert consideration instead. Um, I, I have to assume that uh, the legalities around the capturing of private information and everything else would be taken into account if there was to be provincial direction. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. We, sorry, it's um, after the wrap up. So um, once we have the vote, then I can um, get, some, get your comment. I was uh, hoping to... to Lada? I was hoping Sorry, to ask. I was hoping to ask for a recorded vote, including the student trustees, but I was unaware that I had to ask before wrap up. I'm so sorry. No problem. Um, uh, we'll get you next time. I'm sorry about that. And so, given that, all those in favor. 
Mr. Chair, I believe the request to have the oh, sorry, recorded well, vote, as you, long you right. as it happens before the vote, we would, we would abide that. by it. Um, um, excuse me, uh, Chair, can I have a clarification? So student trustees can request recorded votes at Committee of the Whole? The ability for student trustees to re request a vote is established in the Education Act and the student trustee regulation. And it's expressed for student trustees. I don't have the regulation open in front of me, but if I'm not mistaken, it does say at the board or at its committees. And so that is a different provision than what is in the board bylaws um, with respect to um, recorded votes at committee for uh, general purposes. I'd like to request uh, a memo on why trustees don't have the same um, privileges as, as student trustees in calling for um, recorded votes at Committee of the Hall. Thank you. I believe it's no problem. because... Sorry, go ahead, Executive Officer. Uh, I was just going to say it's because trustees debated it and chose to only allow it at uh, Committee of the Hall budget. So again, um, Mr. Chair... We can write a memo about it. Again, Mr. Chair, point of order here. Like we've had student trustees ask for, for recorded votes on multiple occasions during cow meetings. This is not the first. Suddenly this is now becoming an issue 19 months into being on Zoom. I think it's inappropriate to be asking staff to be developing memos when it's quite easy for us as trustees to look at our bylaws, to look at our policies and make a determination ourselves as to why things are the way they are. So I encourage my colleagues to actually review the uh, codes and the conduct and so forth and policies. I was, I was hoping that I think, the memo um, could give us some information so that I could bring a motion forward to change our bylaws, but okay. Yeah, I, I think if all, all Trustee Ellis requires is uh, the clarification of the two, of the bylaws and the Education Act, I'd, I, I'm hoping that that's not too onerous for someone to produce. So in any case, uh, Trustee Blackburn, did you have anything to add? No, okay. So Sorry, that's um, from something else, my hand just got left up. No problem. Um, so Trustee Scott did request that part A and part B be voted on separately. Um, so, we're going to, uh, that's what we're going to do. So all those in favor of part A of the motion. Excuse me, isn't this a, re a recorded vote as per the trustee's request or student trustee's request? I can grant oh. that, but, but she, uh, she did ask after the wrap up was finished, Trustee Ellis. Mr. Chair, as long as she asks before the vote is taken, I believe okay. that we would comply. All right, so let's do that. Uh, Manager Guthrie, could we have a recorded vote on part A, please? Trustee Scott. You're on mute. Are we, are we voting on part A here? Yes, we're voting on part A. Uh, in favor of part A. Trustee Boothby. In favor. Trustee Blackburn. In favor. Trustee Huff. In favor. Trustee Campbell. In favor. Trustee Ellis. In favor. Trustee Jenikins. In favor. Trustee Lyra. In favor. Trustee Bell. Uh, she left, Trustee the Bell left the meeting. Thank you. Trustee Fisher. In favor. Trustee Schwartz. In favor. Trustee Penny. In favor. Student Trustee Amateur Rahim. In favor. Student Trustee Charles Chen. In favor. Through you, Chair, that is uh, all present, including student trustees in favor of Part A. 
Thank you very much. And if we could do this for part B, I'd appreciate it. Trustee Scott. Opposed. Trustee Boothby. In favor. Trustee Blackburn. Opposed. Trustee Huff. Opposed. Trustee Campbell. In favor. Trustee Ellis. In favor. Trustee Jenikins. Opposed. Trustee Lyra. In favor. Trustee Fisher. Opposed. Trustee Schwartz. Opposed. Trustee Penny. Opposed. Student Trustee Amateur Rahim. In favor. Student Trustee Chen. In favor. A total of seven trustees in favor, sorry, opposed. Four trustees in favor, student, sorry, two student trustees in favor. Thank you very much. So if you got that, that was um, for part A, unanimous, including the student trustees. For part B, four in favor, seven opposed, two, 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 two student trustees in favor. So um, let's move on. It's 10.51. Um, and the next item on the agenda, 8.6, notice of motion re-empowering young people to take action for their own help. Trustee Lara. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so this motion is about working with, it's got two parts. The second of which is about working with Ottawa Public Health to create an education campaign. I think it's really important that we teach young people about the efficacy of vaccines, their role in society, and how herd immunity protects those who are immunocompromised. Um, the first part of this is about teaching students about informed medical consent helping them to understand the existing case law in Ontario and making sure that they understand that they are capable of making medical decisions on their own as soon as they feel competent and a medical practitioner feels they are competent to make those decisions themselves. Thank you very much. And that is your introduction, Trustee Dar. Yes. And is there any any uh, debate on these motions? Trustee Campbell? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am uh, broadly supportive of uh, our supporting information campaigns that may be uh, on COVID awareness, the advantages thereof, uh, uh, rights and obligations and, and, and so forth, which may be undertaken and promoted by Ottawa Public Health. Um, I'm less certain, I guess, that um, as non-medical experts, uh, we should be creating or co-creating or um, um, co perhaps co-creating, that's maybe what I'm stuck on, uh, such education campaigns. Um, I do think that we should uh, do whatever we reasonably can to uh, help OPH in their endeavor to inform not just students, but staff and families and communities within our means and uh, I guess our, our mission and roles, uh, education institution. But um, uh, I guess maybe I, I through you, I, if I could just get a, a, a comment as to what is implied by the create uh, word, uh, would it be Ottawa Public Health? creating the, this information, um, us creating the inf information, would our role be more limited to uh, delivery? I'd just like to, I guess, understand that, that part. So, Trustee Lara, 
I get that. I think that question is to you for as to the intent of the motion. Sure. So uh, we are experts in education. We are experts in helping people to understand the material that we are trying to teach them. And that is an expertise that might not be shared by Ottawa Public Health when it comes to like a strictly medical knowledge that they have that we might not. And so a collaboration can be bringing two people together or two groups together where they have different specialties, different knowledges and working together to create something that we can then deliver to students. Uh, thank you. And I have one more question, Mr. Chair, I guess if that's for, uh, permitted. I guess, uh, thank you. And uh, that is uh, this motion, I uh, under, understand the, the, the mover's uh, uh, concern here, but uh, uh, seems to be sort of exclusively focused on students as opposed to uh, uh, families and communities and, 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 and staff. Um, and I guess I'd be, be happier in a sense if we broadened this to include all these categories. Um, uh, and I guess I'll listen to the uh, debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see that Executive Officer Drew's got her camera on. So was there a staff comment? I guess uh, from a staff perspective, the question I would ask is what would look different um, as a result of passing this motion? And trustees may not be aware, but we meet with all four school boards and public health every Wednesday, um, both as COVID leads and as communications professionals to talk about shared messaging and messaging strategies. And we do generate weekly um, messaging strategies for uh, the community at large, for parents in particular, and for students. Um, and so there is quite a bit of messaging already around this. And so is the expectation that there would be um, uh, an expansion of what's in place currently or something different? Is that question to me? I, I think uh, it might be as to the intent, yes. Okay. Um, so what I had envisioned when I put this forward would be working with Ottawa Public Health to ensure that every student had some kind of brief in classroom under explanation or teaching to this effect, uh, that we educate people about the impacts of uh, health decisions of herd immunity of COVID. Uh, we put out a lot of broad messaging to the community, but I think we're not doing, to my knowledge, targeted work with our student population. Um, I am, to uh, Chris's question, a little bit less concerned about staff who I think are more likely to read our emails um, than uh, some of our student population. And so I think if we want to, to teach students, we need to meet them where they're at. And in this case, that means in the classroom. Okay. So, uh Trustee Campbell that has answered all your questions. Uh, yes, thank you. And I'll listen to the debate. No problem, Trustee Schwartz. Uh, thank you. And uh, my question's actually, um, I guess a little to the mover, but more to staff. Um, so in the, the currently under the, um, the provincial guidelines for uh, parents, for example, uh, sorry, it's late and I'm not being, <laughs> not going to be very clear. Um, but so when, when parents opt not to have their children vaccinated and have to go undergo an education program, um, currently for other vaccines, whether that's for like the MMR vaccine or so on to attend school, who runs those programs? Is that done by the school board or is that done in partnership with OPH? I'll ask uh, Superintendent uh, Reynolds, uh, A.D. Reynolds to respond to the question. Uh, that would all be handled by OPH, anyone seeking okay. an exemption, uh, you know, and whether they receive any kind of education program for their vaccines or not, it's all managed by OPH, we're not aware of that. Uh, and that's one thing I do want to point out, you know, it could be somewhat problematic with the motion as worded in a way it is kind of directing the work of OPH, which really with, is arguably not within our purview, you could direct staff to approach OPH, but they may select or choose to 
follow a different path and we can't really prevent them from doing so. Yeah, so in the case where the province, for example, um, you know, before our motion that we passed for staff uh, mandating vaccines a couple of weeks ago, uh, part of it was if a staff member opted not to be vaccinated before returning to school, they'd have to undergo an education program. Again, who runs that program? Is that done by OPH or is that done by the school board? It's not done by the school board. Okay, so this this gets to my, the very heart of my point then. Oh, sorry, Brett, you wanted to add something? I, I'm sorry if I misheard the question. You mean uh, staff who opt out of the attestation? Yes. So the ministry has provided an educational program for implementation, I believe. Yes. Yeah, I thought you meant the, students. the ministry provided the program. We received it today. It's a video program. We are in the process of trying to figure out how to administer it to our staff so that we can keep track of the fact that they actually did it. So the ministry created, designed it. It's our job to distribute it and to ensure that it's taken. So again, I come back to when a parent decides that they do not want to vaccinate their child, not for COVID, for other uh, mandatory vaccines uh, in order to attend school. Who runs the education programs that they have to, that if they sign the form to say that they don't want their children vaccinated, my understanding is they have to attend an education session. Who runs those education sessions? I'd have to verify that there are in fact education sessions being held, but it is absolutely not us. If that is being held, it is by someone else. And okay. just a reminder that children within this age range can don't require parental consent to be vaccinated. Uh, if I may, Chair, uh, mm -hmm. I, I just want to th get to where I think uh, Trustee Schwartz may be going. Um, essentially, what the clarification that Trustee Lara has provided is an expectation that there is instruction that happens in classrooms to instruct students about not only the value of the vaccine, but their capacity as students who are 12 and over uh, to make the decision to access the vaccine. So that is essentially what would be happening in classrooms by teachers um, with the materials that are developed according to this motion in partnership with um, OPH. So that is what I have understood um, that the motion is, is saying. And I think Trustee Schwartz that where you may be going is um, the question about whether it is actually appropriate uh, for instructional practice to be of that content simply because one of the things that is not commonly understood that curriculum that is used in classrooms is actually a policy document. So every curricular area covered in classrooms are, are governed by a policy around the delivery of, of, of curriculum material. So otherwise people would just develop anything that they wanted to. Um, and so we now go into um, some other questions about the expectation of teachers um, to deliver such material and our capacity to, in, to expect teachers to deliver material that is outside of the curriculum. And so this is where we have committed in our partnership with OPH to essentially provide to um, uh, executive officer's point, uh, multiple meetings happen where the educational expertise um, that is required to influence uh, the students, that expertise is shared at those tables. Similarly, the tables where I sit and I am consulted, I am able to talk about what are is considered, how will this work in a school? Here are the things you need to think about. And so that those experts who have the um, purview uh, to develop some of these pieces um, are doing that in the right, um, for lack of a better word, lane. So in the healthcare lane, um, this is delivered. So I, I would say, and because A names me specifically um, that the director do thus and so, um, I can indicate as an educator 
um, there are layers of problems um, with that. Um, and I would go as far as to say there may be outside of the policy cha challenges and the professional challenges um, and the contractual challenges, uh, I would suggest there may be some ethical challenges as well. Thank you so much for your clarification and for understanding exactly where I was directing my question because you answered it exactly what I was expecting. Thank you. And so with that, I have to call the 11 o'clock vote and I might remind trustees that we need uh, unanimous consent to continue past 11. Chair and Scott so is trying to speak, but she's on mute. Mr. Chair, may I make a motion with regard to the 11 o'clock vote? Yes. Uh, and I would like to move that we continue our meeting past 11 to complete the item that is currently on the floor. All right. Um, and then we there... will stop. Yes. Okay. That is what she is suggesting. Okay. Um, and I believe that's, uh, I don't know what type of motion that is, whether it's a procedural motion or whatever, but um, uh, I think I'm just going to call the question on that. All those in favor? And opposed? And there, there is uh, at least uh, one dissenter, uh, Christy Scott. Um, so it's not unanimous. Um, if you interpret that as the 11 o'clock vote, then it's not unanimous, I'm sorry. If it's not unanimous, then, then uh, the meeting ends now. That's right, and so uh, thank you very much, trustees. We are adjourned. We'll have to um, work uh, at agenda planning to find out when the rest of the items uh, um, can be fit in and hopefully it, um, we will do it sooner rather than later. So thank you very much and thank you for an excellent meeting. Good night.